Hey, welcome to Tone Talk. How's everybody doing today? It's uh, Friday night after a long week. It's uh, Dave and Mark, and it's episode 50. Episode 50. Wow. Yeah. 50. Episode my 50. Age. Yeah, except my age too, as well. Uh, and tonight's special guest 51. <laughs> is also. Oh, you're one off. Oh, you're one off. You're 51. All right. You're, 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 the, uh, you're the elder of the crowd. So, <laughs> I, I, I like to forget my age. <laughs> me too. I, me too. I was going to say. So tonight we've got from throwback pickups and um, pickups and pedals, right? Um, yeah. That's yeah. Good. John Gundry. John, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. I'm, I I finally get to meet you in um, virtual flesh. Yes. Virtual. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, hopefully I'll meet you oh, at uh, Nam or or something. Yeah, yeah. I go every year to walk it. Yeah. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah. Come yeah. on by. Yeah, actually, I, w I was at uh, the the I saw Dave in full um, Jerry Cantrell mode. Oh. We were, we we're doing signing stuff, and I uh. thought I, I didn't want to interrupt the magic. You're a little bit busy then. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was Nam was that was a crazy Nam. That really was. It was especially at Dave's area. That whole area was just like rocking the entire oh, time. It was very busy there. Very yeah, busy. yeah. And it's not like it's in like the best location, I guess. But it's just you know, like it's just so much all going. Of, all, all of the whole show, or the... yeah, like out of you know, like out of the like even the guitar gear stuff. It's not in like the yeah. best location. Yeah, it's spread out a little bit. I wish we could have one of those upstairs like rooms, maybe. That'd be cool. Upstairs rooms? Yeah. I've never even been upstairs. Yeah, like, like you know where Fender is. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. That would be amazing. But those rooms have no, to be ESP and and stuff generally. It's a cool <laughs> amp oasis. It's always nice to go by there and see you know everything that's there. Yeah. <laughs> as as they gobble up more companies. <laughs> yeah. If they gobble up any more, then uh, the uh, the booth will have to get larger because we're out of space. Yeah, yeah. Believe it or not, that's it true. Seem that way because yeah. you got Saldano next, who's not going to just be against the wall, right? I mean, uh, yeah. Who knows? We'll see what they're going to be arguing over uh, over sound room space. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I'm not giving mine up. <laughs> no, don't. Please don't. 20 um, by 20 or whatever it is. I think I'm a, I think I'm a little, I'm a little hot right now. That's uh David Le David Lee Ruff reference. Um I don't know, my my mic looks goes into the red, but uh, so All right. So anyway, yeah. John. John, yes. man. So Yes. How the hell did you make a mistake coming into the music industry? Oh. <laughs> Well, do you want this is a long show, so I can give you the long, long reply. You can, yeah. you can, yeah, you okay. can give, you can give every sort of detail. If <laughs> okay. You want. Well, I, so I, I was thinking about this before the show, but because um, you knew know, we were going to ask this. Yeah, yeah, and I know this thing lasts like two or three hours, so I've got to be prepared. <laughs> so it started when I was a kid. Uh, no, I, I kind of, I came from. I didn't really realize it at the time, but. Uh, my mom's side of the family is a musical family. And um, when I was a kid, every every summer we'd go visit my grandparents that were in Missouri, lived in the Ozarks in Missouri. And my grandfather, who played fiddle, and his dad played fiddle, were sort of local legends. And my grandpa would always be repairing some musical instrument for someone locally, usually a guitar or a fiddle. And he would have the grandkids help him out. Mm. So I, I kind of early on, I, I realized that, you know, it was it became anything music related seemed very approachable, especially technically. So when I was a teen, he showed me how to rehair bows. And uh, I took violin lessons as a kid. And the, but when I was a teen, I really got interested in guitar. So kind of having the technical part of it not be such a mystery made it so 
like if guitar player had a, uh, you know, build your own boost circuit. Mm-hmm. Thought, well, I can do that. I, I'll give it a shot. So, so I did that sort of thing when I was in high school and started uh, kind of keeping my eye out for any sort of guitar that maybe needed to be fixed up. Mm-hmm. And I kind of knew what to look for because my, my grandpa and my grandmother backed him up on guitar. So I had a, I had a rough idea of what to look for if I found a used guitar. And then I'd try to find one that needed to be fixed up. So I would, I, I started refretting guitars, just my own at age 15. And then I, I'd go to everybody locally that did it and when i could drive and ask them for pointers and they were nice enough to do it to you know give me info about it and so eventually just kind of personally i'd I'd made a few electronics Mm -hmm. as a teen and done a fair amount of kind of personal guitar repair of my own and then when going to college i just did that for fun um, I went to college for film and video and photography. And when I got out of college, I, I ended up doing a bit of assisting for photography and starting a commercial studio mm. locally, really low scale. And um, it built that up. And the way that business works is there's a fair amount of downtime between jobs. So at some point, I decided, well, I'll fill in those spaces with what I'm doing for fun anyway, which is guitar-related projects. Eventually, that led to doing effect pedals. So about 2001, I, 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 did, I made the Strange Master and the Stonebender, which were my first two products. I etched, I etched all the circuit boards and did mm-hmm. all of that myself. And... That is how I got into it because they sold. <laughs> so, <laughs> they sold well, right? Yeah, they sold well. I put them on eBay at the time. That was kind of the way most people were selling online, and I, I, I thought, well, I, I've, I've got, I can, I know I can present these well on eBay because I'm, ta- I'm I can take good photos of it. Um, I know I like it. I know my friends do. I know the tweaks that I've applied to it. I think there aren't a whole lot of uh, variations of that circuit available. So I thought, well, I'll I'll give it a shot selling it. And since I I had the luxury of having a business, uh, so I could, I'm sure I made decisions as far as what, how to approach adding new products that I would not have made if that, if the electronics part of guitar electronics were the only part of my business right so so what you're saying is you make (laughs) cool stuff yeah i could make without regard for uh what they're going to (laughs) sell yeah Yeah, i could make cool stuff that satisfied what i wanted and what i saw wasn't available at the time and i would so i would kind of indulge myself as to what the specs would be oh that's then yeah total fun yeah, yeah. So I had fun with it. And then I, I had the luxury of being my own line of credit, I guess, in a very small way. And then I, so I would get the specs to where I wanted it without regard to price. And then I'd figure out if I could sell it. And I'd just price it accordingly. And people would buy them. And they'd be very happy with them. So that was great. Eventually, the um, I, I was a commercial photographer for 20 years. And eventually, the electronics were half of my business. And it kept growing and growing and growing until eventually, when I, well, when I started commercial photography, everything was uh, film. And everything, almost everything I shot was with a view camera with 4x5 film. And I could see that the, that was transitioning to digital. Right. And as that happened, I would get I maintain the same amount of business, in fact, get more because I now be doing retouching. But the number of clients would get smaller. So it was, so I, at some point I thought, I'm still, the business is still good, but I've got a lot of eggs in that one basket. 
for the photography part of it. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm just going to concentrate on building the electronics portion of it, the guitar electronics portion of the business, because it was more fun anyway, really. Mm-hmm. Although it's pretty fun being a photographer. But uh, my main client for photography was Bissell. So there's mm-hmm. a limit to how fun photographing vacuum cleaners can be. <laughs> so, so, so I, I decided at some point I'm doing the digital and then uh, photography, but it became clear that they were now starting to do photographic renderings from CAD files. Mm. And I thought, well, it's just a matter of time before a lot of this business that I've got now is trimmed back as far as the photography goes. So I thought, I'm just, the, the business is going to be the guitar electronics. That's what I'm going to concentrate on. And I, I, I paired back the photography clients and eventually had two, which were Bissell and Kawasaki, which has an industrial mm. uh, arm here in town. And uh, eventually decided they had, I, I just had to concentrate on the electronic guitar electronics portion of it. Right. Along the way, I, and two, all up through there, while I was doing the, the photography, again, I could make decisions that looking back on it, I know why a lot of businesses don't make kind of the level of detail of, of let's say, a PAF repro that we make. It's because there's a lot of money that goes into it, and it takes a while to, you know, it's a significant investment up front. If you decide today's the day we're going to do this, and uh, I did it incrementally over several years with a different business paying for it. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. but but by the time it worked out very well because by the time I was done with photography, I, I already had an established reputation for what I had put that money into, and I had satisfied customers with it. And I, so. I was it it really turned out to be the best thing to do although when I when I switched to from photography which is a service business to just the manufacturing for about two years I was like I know we're making you know I know we're making stuff the same way but I did not realize I was approaching it as a service business rather than manufacturing so I I, I realized at some point I have not made the, the calculation in my brain that the amount of time you do for any process adds up to money and efficiency. So mm-hmm. it after a, a year or two of, of that, I finally realized, hey, I've got to I've got to just be more efficient in how we assemble things. I, I kind of discovered, I don't know, it kind of has a bad name, but lean manufacturing principles where you pay mm-hmm. attention to you know, if you have a piece of equipment that can speed up a process, you, you need to do it because it'll quickly pay for itself. And once it's paid for, it's right. money. It's then the new itself, then it's profit, yeah. more profit for you. Yeah. By the way, I just want to mention um, Justin Espinoza. Thanks for the super chat. Uh, by the way, for those watching, please hit the subscribe button. I never mentioned that ever in any of our shows so please hit the uh, subscribe button if you can uh we have a super chat also if you want to get your question in faster like justin who says dave why not do a vertical two by 12 would y'all thanks and that will get and i answered him actually in in the chat oh you did said the vertical 212 is done and it's going to be released oh sweet okay. when i'm not sure yet but shortly i would imagine i just got to we're, we're dealing with all sorts of releases right now, so it's going to be a little bit, probably a little bit still. All right. Thanks, Justin. Appreciate that. Um, sorry, John. So you were saying, so well, efficiencies. I, I want a vertical 2x12. Is it fully enclosed or is it ported? Uh, it has a tiny little port like a high watt cab does in back. Oh, cool. Oh, man. Which is like how I do my other 212s, and it, it's really yeah. cool. a little slant cab. looks like a baby Four by twelve, kind of, but yeah, it's yeah. Like, yeah. Came out really good. Sounds good. Yeah, actually, I should have said that the real reason I I did this business is is an excuse to buy stuff. 
<laughs> or or <laughs> tree. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, actually, it was a conscious, conscious decision at the beginning. Yeah. That, you know, if I had this as a business, I, I, I'm not really getting flack from my wife on buying stuff, guitars or anything guitar related. But now there's a real reason. Oh, yeah, it. yeah. That, now, now when you buy a guitar, also you you know you can write it off, also yeah. you know completely, and you know, so mm. it's an important part of the business. Maybe I need to incorporate Tone Talk, <laughs> make, well, an, yeah, yeah. make an LLC or something. That way, I, any of all that gear that I keep buying, <laughs> I can write. That I think off. you need to. Yeah, yeah, I might, I might need. To. Actually, yeah, just, just, just for that. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, for all the money you make from Tone Talk. Oh yeah, no, all I'm the talking. money we make from Tim Talk. <laughs> yeah, all the money we make. Yeah, well, that's why We're I said getting rich, people, don't you know? Everybody, please subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I must say that I, I, I used to be more interested in pedals than I am now. I used to work. I worked at a record store once, and I, and after about maybe a month, I thought I don't really want to buy any more records or CDs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of feel that way about music gear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you see it. You see it every day, and then you, um, it's for some reason the pedals do that with me. I still see a guitar. It's a little messed up. I think, oh, I, I, if I could get it at that price, mm. you know, it's at the right price, I could fix it up, and then I, you know, I could sell it later. The problem is I never sell them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Or when uh, I buy stuff nowadays, is I gotta really want it. I, I have to like really have a want for what I'm buying. Chances yeah. are, I might not touch it after I buy it, but but yeah, I really want it because you know there's a lot yeah, of I, it really like... spur my interest when I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've just that really the really want it uh, ideology is important, especially when you start running out of space to put the stuff. Ah, <laughs> that's the problem. That's the problem. You think I need higher quality items because the lower quality ones are taking up too much space. <laughs> yeah, I have a wall full of guitars and I play like two of them. Yeah. Well, I just saw that Alex video where he stole your telly. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> that, <laughs> that pink uh, little shell little pink. Little fun joke video. Yeah, that was funny. Shell Pink Esquire I made. Friedman Shell Pink Esquire. And boy, is it cool. It is. It looked <laughs> nice. It looked real it nice. It sounds great. Very cool. Yeah, and Esquire well, is always got another cool. super chat. Oh, yeah? Super chat day, apparently. Uh, what's my favorite guitar speaker for guitar cabs? Oh, man, really? Uh, metal tone, though, he says, for metal you? tone. Oh, metal tone. Um, okay, for metal tone, probably... You know, I like a Vintage 30. Um... I've had heard the Selection 100s that can be okay for a metal tone. For metal tone. Uh, phew, maybe 75 watt Celestians can work sometimes, depending on the amp. Uh, other than that, there are no choices. <laughs> K100s. Vintage 30. Vintage 30s or, or the, the, the higher wattage, the 75 watt. I find the vintage uh, 30s no. sound good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, it depends on the amp. It depends on the amp. You know, like, like, you know, depends on what amp you have and how fizzy it is and what speaker might match up better with that. And, yeah. Yeah. I, I gig with every once in a while. I've got a blues band every once in a while. We do a gig. And I find just for blues, I like the classic lead 80 just as a speaker. Mm. Actually, that, wait, that. That's a mention too. The classic lead eighty. Uh, I forgot about that speaker. Actually, it, it's not widely used, but that also could be a p potential cool speaker I, for people. I like it because I feel like it sounds like a Celestion, but it's got it just has more headroom on the low end. I don't know. That's the way I feel about it. For yeah. you're playing clean edge of breakup blues, it it might not be the first choice for rock though, but. Seems to work well for that. Yeah, I wonder if they have an IR for that. We got a new super chat, ten dollars. Wonder from, if they have an IR for that from boy Ben Breer. Boy, isn't that modern? Ben, thank you. Yeah, tone talk rocks. Get rich, baby. <laughs> I love it. 
Thanks, man. Really appreciate it. You bought us. You bought us a hot dog at Nam. <laughs> <laughs> thank you and a beer maybe <laughs> maybe a beer not both not no like not, both. Dollars, not both not both the hot dog yeah <laughs> i should say that part part of the my um throwback business was me deciding that at one point that i could make an amp without really knowing how to do it i made an 18 watt clone for a while and then i realized just because there's a form that shows you how to do it doesn't mean you really know how to make an amp <laughs> and i thought i thought you know I can make this the way I want it, but I really don't understand enough about it. <laughs> mm. So I dropped it. Also, the overhead cost for doing an amp. Yeah. Uh-huh. Compared to <laughs> or pedals, it was it was like you know, there's only so many times I want to order twenty of everything. You know. You have beautiful graphics on your pedals. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Like that yeah. vintage, you know, that total tone bender vintage style. Yeah. It, I, I, the weird thing is, I, I well, I know where it came from. It came from those original tone bender style. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like it's pedals, like, but, but I just to see it on a new pedal, it's like, uh, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I want. Yeah. I don't care what it sounds like. I just want it because it looks cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I found that weirdly the the pickup uh, this uh, doing this business i found that i can apply a bunch of stuff that i learned elsewhere that mm-hmm. i would have never expected so i mean i i've obviously borrowed the graphics for the stone bender but mm-hmm. i could do the i could do it electron you know i could do the graphics myself i had enough contact with advertising and marketing people to kind of have a little bit of idea of, of what worked <laughs> And uh, and I could do my own photography and even weird things like I uh, when I get an old like I've got when I got my first Lisa 102 winding machine, it had to be rebuilt. And my dad as a hobby rebuilt Studebakers. Oh, cool. And, and I, so in high school, I had rebuilt, well, sort of rebuilt with pop rivets and sheet metal for the floor pan, a 64 Daytona Studebaker. And I thought. When I got the machine, I was like, oh, it's a piece of cake taking this thing apart compared to a Studebaker. So just about there's a that's part of the fun of, of, of I find of pickups, pedals, guitar related stuff is there's there's kind of a combination of mechanical, electronic, and then there's a craft and artistic part of it. Yeah. All combined into one, and it's, so if you've got interest in any of those areas or all, it's it's satisfying to create stuff that way. So I, I think that's why I just decided at some point that was really needed to be what I did mm-hmm. as a business. So, so what what are the, what are the pedals that you have? I know you've got the Stone Bender, right? And there's yeah, a- the first the the first two. I I mean, so I've got four pedals. And I've had those four pedals for forever, except I did have a fifth one that I dropped because it was a variation on one of the circuits. It didn't really sell a lot. But I started with the Stonebender and the Strange Master, so it's a Range Master and a Tone Bender. But I, I put my tweaks on those circuits, and people like them. But I, 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 I wanted to do just classic circuits that were not widely available in in vintage form at the time and then i added the fuzz haze which is a fuzz face and, and the overdrive boost which is uh similar to a color sound overdriver or power boost oh, those are cool yep. yeah with all of those i just added my tweaks to the circuit and my, and my goal with with it was too is to make it more widely adjustable than than the vintage circuit to the point too where you can actually adjust. You can adjust in tones that you would not want. And but strangely, a lot of people. Someone will want it. So, yes. Yeah. So I've got a, the overdrive boost. You can make it sound like the 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 pedals or the uh, speaker on your amp is gone. Great. And, yeah, and people like that. But some people. <laughs> they but, do. But, <laughs> so, some people will say, "Hey, there's something wrong with this thing," and and. I just say, well, adjust the knobs till it's the way you want. Mm-hmm. You know, reminds but me of a. 
reminds me of like Zvex when he he had the uh, on his pedal the super hard oh, on yeah. it's like crackle okay yeah you know yeah, like yeah. okay just because well, oh yeah I, let me explain how many times so like in all my amps i use a, a vintage plexi presence circuit so the knob crackles well it doesn't uh, crackle it, it scratches same thing with the depth knob or the, the thump knob um and i put this in the manual this is normal don't be afraid you know like <laughs> And I still get I still get people emailing oh, me. Yeah. I think there's something wrong with this amp. We need to send it back. I go, no, no, you don't. It's right. It's normal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's the that's... same thing with a uh, like a, any sort of treble boost circuit. Same thing. It's a, it's going to be scratchy. Yeah. But you just, it won't matter how often you point that out. Someone will find it and think there's something wrong. But so let, let, let's go to how how where did the pickup part come in? into the business so you, you started yeah. this business and it, you kind of just went yeah. in the whole thing but where did the pickup part come in yeah so th about 2001 i started with the pedals and after i did four i realized at some point honestly i i i kind of i made what i wanted which was those four boost circuit booster fuzz circuits and I didn't. I didn't have some groundbreaking idea on how to make something different than wasn't already out there. It just. It didn't seem interesting to me. But I did. I did find it intriguing that that uh, the PAF in particular had a mythical status. Um, but at the time, on on picket making forums. And even on just uh, online forums, the the lore was that the, that they were hand wound, and I knew that they weren't. I knew that these were machine wound pickups, so I would point that out periodically on forums, and I would get I would get uh, often angry responses. No, the best ones are hand wound. So I thought, well, I know they're not. I know that none of them were. I I it, it seemed intriguing to me to make to see if I could just do the most accurate cosmetically, tonally, mechanically repro of that, of a PAF. And also, I didn't mention this, but part of, part of my background is my grandfather and his dad were hobbyist violin makers, hmm. and I am a hobby, hobbyist violin maker. And kind of the granddaddy of, of the mythical I, uh, musical item is a Stradivarius. And mm -hmm. it's its own sort of category of, of uh, lore as to, like, why are they so desirable? Why are they, uh, why, why does everybody want them? Why do they sound so, so good? And it, the, so there's any number of, theories as to why they're that way and and I, I had done violin workshops and it's a pretty complex little item a violin is mechanically and so i thought you know well from that i real you learned that the reason they're different really has a lot to do with the process of how they were made the tools that he used the uh, patterns he used and a lot of it was set up for him to do efficiently and he came up with Stradivari came up with innovations that allowed him to make something repeatable that sounded very good and um but there's a lot of levels and details to that and so i thought a, a pickup it, it, and two with the violins the history of it is that there's literally was at one point people that went to his old house straight over his old house and got went into his attic and got all of his t forms and tools so i thought you know this the paf has a, a mythical status and i bet that what part a large part of what makes it unique and desirable tonally has to do with the the um what the choices were as far as the manufacturing as far as manufacturing choices for materials, uh, how they wound it, what machines they used, all these small details. 
I figured will probably add up to a difference. So I thought, well, you know, I'm just going to make it a fun project for myself, and I'm just going to try to learn every detail of that that I can of a PAF. And I thought, you know, if people had done this with Stradivari you know, more than 200 years ago, and Kalamazoo's down the street, you know, an hour south of me, 40, hour 45 minutes south of me, and they were making them in 19, the 1950s, late 1950s, there's got to be some information I can glean from that. Mm -hmm. So, so I thought, well, it'll just be a fun project to see if, see what I can find out. And it eventually led to me buying two of the machines that were in the factory, finding out the other two machines that they also used to make them, finding people locally that, uh, whose dad used to do, do the buffing and grinding process for their covers, for PAF covers, because a big part, kind of, if you're really into super into the vintage details, a big part of, of the PAF for the vintage enthusiasts is what it looks like. And um, I found out how part of why they look that way is just simply how they were ground and buffed. Mm -hmm. So I found places that did base plates for Gibson. Basically, I have tracked down just about every supplier and had had either had tooling made for us or found someone who could do the same thing locally. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of lucky. This is a good spot for for that because Grand Rapids still has has a manufacturing base from the furniture industry and um, the, the automotive industry. It, it, it never took the hit that the Detroit area did. I don't think yeah. a lot of these smaller shops, mm. although although Kalamazoo did, I'm pretty sure that and um, they. But anyway, I could. I can, I can meet with people on a smaller scale, as far as getting very de detailed work done, and I don't have. I can have a smaller order, in a in a few thousand rather than twenty, thirty thousand that you might expect of somebody in a much bigger city might expect. So anyway, with all of that, I, I kind of systematically th went through each piece uh, of the uh, of the pickup and uh, duplicated it to the best uh, of my ability. And then if I found out new information, I would improve upon that. So the pickups, though, I just found, I just found the pickups more intriguing than pedals. And at some, at some point, it became clear to me that the pedal part of the business was really more, you, you really needed to come out with something new every six oh, months yeah. oh yeah you know and i thought at one point i thought I, I i really ought to do that and i just couldn't get myself as excited about doing that that i as i could with pickups there's something kind of strangely magical about a pickup when you're making it you can it, it's it seems like it's a very simple item and uh, i think that's probably why it attracts a lot of smaller time smaller size makers is because you really you can make something that sounds good with the sewing machine motor and the correct wire and and some practice and a little knowledge mm -hmm. sure uh, and there, yeah and there's lots of guys who do ways that. to skin a cat a lot of yeah. lot, in other words um there's lots of different wire there's lots of different things and winding techniques and ways to do it that will also get you a good tone oh yeah yeah you, it, it's just a different they use different ingredients in the recipe, yeah. and they still made in the end. It still tasted good, <laughs> yeah. you know, so to speak. Yeah, yeah uh, so, just different. Yeah, mm -hmm. so personally, I just found that intriguing. That wow, you can adjust these parameters, it, and you get, you get this magical little item. And with the pedals, I, I, I just felt like there was more. There was more. It did, I don't know. For some reason, it didn't. It seemed more like beyond what the classic circuits that I was tweaking beyond that, it was kind of coming up with cool sounds, but they didn't have, uh, it didn't, you know, the pickup, 
it, it's expressive no matter with everything, you mm-hmm. know, whether you're playing clean or dirty or you have it with the pedal. So I just seen, it just seemed the pickups themselves seemed more intriguing to me. So I, I just decided for myself and it, and because it wasn't my only business, I decided I'll, I, this is what seems interesting to me. I'll pursue that. I'll, I'll pursue the pickups in the direction that I want to, mm-hmm. which at the time was, I want to make as, a, as accurate a, a PAF repro as I could. Right. So I highly advise. Uh, You've done a good job. Well, thank you. <laughs> but I, I really looking back on, it, I do think, wow, you know, I, um, I really did. I did luck out that I could, I had a job that I could do it in the gaps of, of other yeah. work. Frank, frankly, looking at your list of the pickups you make now, uh, I, I, I get confused. Oh, I did. <laughs> the daily call I get. I mean, I mean, like for, for even for me, I mean, and I know something about all of it. Yeah. Uh, I'm like looking at it going, huh, from the description, which one would I like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this is a problem. First of all, like, yeah, this is the downside of, of uh, kind of being your own, uh, just uh, doing a business like that and not having to answer to anybody. My name, my names mean nothing almost. So yes, they, and they're hard to remember. And which yeah. ones? Which, yeah, yeah, I can. They don't really express what they sound like. Yeah. And um, yeah, but I, I, the it's daily. I'll get a call or an email. It'll be like, I'm ready to buy some pickups. I just, I, they all look great. I don't know what to get. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's like me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Hey, well, we got a, we got a couple but, questions uh, from super chat questions so uh i think the first one was from ben burnett uh thanks ben uh he says john can you discuss the pros and cons of high output pickups trade-offs at at what point in output does the tonal characteristic of the pickup suffer and third part have you thought about a pickup design for amp modelers for amp modelers uh, do Dave, do you allow questions about amp modelers? <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of thinking that if you want to put a throwback pickup into an amp modeler, you should be shot. But yeah. so, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't really. Here's my thoughts on that. I, 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 like, I'll, I'll chime in. Um, I, I think whatever pickup you're going to use into an amp modeler might not matter that much because there is no dynamics to an amp modeler. So yeah. you roll well, your volume knob down, it's kind of the same. You roll it up, it's kind of the same. There's not really any kind of – it's it's kind of the same. Well, I, I would – Not to say that it's not an interesting tool or a decent tool for someone, but – yeah, my, now my only experiment or experience with an amp modeler is like a Fender Mustang three, right? I did find with that that um, with a with a D, I, I assume this is a function of a D style power section that you're not you're not getting you're not getting the character on the low end that you would get with with a real tube amp that was. Uh, uh, a B or class A. So I'm with, and I haven't really tested this, but I would say that you might, that it, given that you might want to have a, a set of pickups that are lower in resistance. Mm. So you're not hitting that top end of the headroom of the amp as quickly. I would think so. Yeah. So, but with, what I usually tell people about resistance and pickups and, and output, at first they say, I tell people, you know, perceived output with something like a PAF is a function of a combination of the magnet and the resistance. So you kind of have to think of them separately. A stronger magnet will give you a higher perceived output and a weaker one will give you a lower perceived output. Higher resistance will, I I tell people too, in, in terms of resistance of the pickup, they need to think of it as higher resistance is less headroom for your amp. It's going to drive the amp quicker. Mm-hmm. And uh, a lower, the lower the resistance goes, it's more headroom for the amp. And beyond that, 
as the resistance goes up, it shifts the um, the uh, the resonant peak of the pickup. Generally, a ge good general rule is it becomes darker and less defined treble content as you go up in resistance. So given that, you need to ask the person. The person needs to know, well, do I want a pickup that will hit my amp as hard as possible? And, and uh, you know, maybe that if you've got a higher wattage amp, maybe that's a good choice. Mm -hmm. But you may be with a lower wattage amp, you're going to sacrifice low end definition because you're going to hit the upper limits of the headroom of the amp quicker. So and I think part of this has to do with, you know, just personal preference of the player. Because I, I I know there's there's a school of thought for for metal guys that they want a, a low less, something like a T-top that's a lower resistance pickup. They want they want the amp to produce the distortion. Mm -hmm. And there's guys that want a much higher resistance because they want the pickup to really drive the amp. So you kind of have to decide for yourself which which is your preference. And I think you really have to do that based upon what experience you've had with other guitars and pickups if you're aware of what the resistance is as far as the magnet goes for a paf the reality with that that spec for paf is that it varies throughout the era of a paf and generally a, a, an alco 5 is going to be the strongest of the bunch and it had the most perceived output but really maybe more important with the magnet is that it changes the inductance of the pickup and effectively I like to think of it as it's a way of how the magnet beyond its charge affects the EQ of the pickup and some guys know know that they prefer the tonal character of an Alnico 2 magnet or an Alnico 5 or an Alnico 4 or 3 but very often people don't know that. So if you want to try to make the best <clears throat> resistance output, ideally you would know, based upon experience with other pickups, which of those you prefer. Mm -hmm. And kind of that combination gives your, uh, can give you a, an idea of what, what output works for you with your rig setup. That's the other thing. The, the, rig, the rig and guitar people use, and even the strings, have a, a big impact on what the final tone is. Sure, the, the string gauge has everything to do uh, with what choice you might make uh, with your pickup. Yeah, yeah, and even whether or not you're you're choosing like a, a pure nickel string or a um, nickel plated steel string, mm -hmm. you know, because that the a, a, a pure nickel string can with pure nickel often people think well it's a warmer tone. And it does have a bit of a warmer character. The treble content on the wound strings is a little snappier with a pure nickel string, but a um, or sorry with a uh, nickel plated steel string. But a pure nickel string, you're getting less signal out of those wound strings, mm. so you get actually get a bit more headroom with a pure pure nickel string on the low end than you would with a, a nickel plated steel wound string. So that's another that's another interesting part of being around here. A few years ago, I, I for years I was trying to get GHS to make strings with our label just so I could give them away with pickups. Mm. I could I could never even get anybody to talk there to me about that. But a few years ago, I found out that that one of the machine shops that Gibson had used for years, uh, and Heritage uses still the guy that was a father son machine shop that made. Uh, guitar string winding machines and literally, literally if you go out the building i'm in and turn left and then right after two blocks and drive for 20 minutes you're at their machine shop and and they still make a guitar string winding machine that they once made for gibson updated with computer controls now but once i found this out i said hey i called them up and i said can you make with uh you know i'll, I'll package them up but I, we'll, we'll pretend that we don't hear that, Dave. We'll just pretend. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I, I, I basically, I said to them, can you guys do some round core pure nickel strings? Because there's very few choices for it. 
And they were like, why would you want those? Because in their thick mind, it was like, this is an archaic. No one does rounds core strings anymore because they're problematic if you don't trim them right. So, but essentially, and why do you want pure nickel? Because no one uses that anymore. But I convinced them, hey, if I buy the material, would you guys make some pure nickel strings, round core, some hex core, pure nickel? And they're like, sure. So, so that's how we've got guitar strings. And basically, they're made by the guys that make the machines, huh. which is, which I, it's like, I don't know where anywhere else where I could, I mean, I, I'm sure I could, someplace like Los Angeles or I'm sure there's people that would wow. do that, but that's pretty it's cool. so accessible here if you know where to find it. Right. That it's kind of another one of those cool quirks about being here. Um, also, the cost of living is low enough that I don't freak out. Right. right. Yeah, it's definitely different than L.A., that's for sure. So, oh, my God, yes. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. Um, we've got another super chat question, but I, I'm, I'm just curious. What are you eating, Dave? Or what do you? you I wasn't eating it. Oh, because I'm starting to get hungry. I was like, I wanted to go. No, that, that was a, that was a uh, no. That was my table falling apart that I was tearing something off of. Oh. <laughs> okay. Nothing. Got nothing it. good like that. All oh, right. I thought it was some chips or something. I'm like, no. Um. So, mo wait, 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 modern vintage has a question. Uh. I'm mostly a metal player. Love my butter slacks V30 cab. Any reason to get a 100 deluxe besides the clean channel? I mostly use channel two, then channel three for the meaner tone. So he's using channel two and channel three for the butt with his butter slacks. Any reason to get the 100 deluxe? I mean, I, 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 if you're mainly using that stuff, I don't. I mean, I'm going to be quite honest. I don't really see why you'd have to have the deluxe. I mean, if you needed other sounds and other, you know, uh, less sort of heavy things, maybe. But no, it's not really going to. No, you don't need it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Dave, I've got a, I've got a question. I, I don't I'm not looking enough to have a Friedman dealer near me. But I, if, for, if like a, for a blues guy, is the Dirty Shirley the, the most appropriate of your answers? Yes guy that just wants a, a single 12 combo that they can yes classic uh fat uh uh yeah classic fat warm yes yes sure i think that Absolutely. i think I'm, i think i may need to put that on my list of must-have items for the year uh, I'll, I'll, we can we can work that out it's uh it's also great i mean you can get from bluesy stuff and then you could also go to like Van Halen with the Dirty Shirley, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, it gives you a lot of. It gives you from actually all the way pretty clean actually too. Yeah. So yeah. it gives you pretty everywhere in between, but it's a very fat tone. Yes. And okay. it's, uh, uh, I would tend to say on the darker side. Well, you know, I think personally that that's what I prefer for blues with that style of amp. I yeah. Think because I, I often I'll I've got a, a matchless lightning clone and that's a pretty dark amp mm. and I find that works great for either humbuckers or uh, or single coil pickups but that's a, that's a darker chunkier sounding amp right is it kind of along that line is when you say darker is that it's got more low end thump oh it definitely has that yeah yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> It's got lots of low end. Yeah, I think clean. I like having an amp if you're playing not or edge of breakup that's got low end thump like that. Yeah, I think you'd like it then. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, Michael Gutierrez, thanks for uh, the super chat. He says, "Hey guys, how do you describe a good original PAF to a bad one? And what are your thoughts on the double cream Demarzio thing? Love the show, guys. <laughs> ah, the double cream. The double." <laughs> <laughs> okay so well w the first question was uh what uh, the difference between a good and a bad pa yeah, good original paf to a bad one. okay um well the interesting part of this with just about anything tonal is someone's great tone is also someone else's horrible tone very yeah. often yeah, very true yeah, um mm -hmm. but i find 
the, the ones very often if they're you can have PAFs that are very high resistance and they often I find work very well for slide but if you want to play a variety of music it's uh, it's not it's not going to have the sort of dynamic range or possibilities of lower resistance style PAF will so and they tend to get you a very higher resistance, you you may notice too much a disparity between the very upper uh, uh, treble on the unwound strings and the treble content of the low strings. And there's no way to, you can't really adjust that out. So you have that difference. It's a little harder to get a balanced tone out of it that way. So I would say the, the worst PAFs are, are, don't have a good enough balance between the lows and the highs between the high E and the low E strings. Um, a, a, a good one, and it, I, I, my experience with them is that there are some that are very, very good, and they, most of them are actually very clear even the ones that you might not consider outstandingly great pickups. But the ones that stick out as being particularly bad are the ones that don't have the balance between the low and the high end. Mm-hmm. And what, what I guess sort of understand. Like, uh, for me, that to answer that question, um, of the ones I've heard, and I have some clients that have had beautiful 59 Les Pauls with great PAFs and the ones I like the most are the ones that actually are have a kind of a nice little mid-range grunt to them with the top end that's not too presency mm-hmm. and the low end that's not too extreme. I've heard other ones that sound brighter on the top end, brighter presence with bigger low end, which tend to be kind of loose sounding and not really that mm-hmm. great. I mean, I'm talking for like more of a martially rock sort of yeah. tone. Yeah. Uh, the ones with a little bit of a mid-range growl in the middle is the ones I prefer. Now, I know this one particular guitar that I'm thinking about. Uh, it could be the guitar, too, but God, it has. It's a 59, and God, it's good sounding. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> Every time I hear that guitar, I'm like, oh. Yeah, there's I, there's definitely, you cannot take the guitar out of the equation yeah. with, with a lot of that. And um, there are some guitars that and it does make it. It does make it more of a distance or difference with something like a PAF because it's not potted. Mm-hmm. It's not wax potted, so you it does get the acoustic resonance of the guitar coming through the pickup. Mm-hmm. And so the that which is part of the great character of them. But so ideally, you'd have a very good synergy between the pickup and the acoustics of the guitar. And yeah, some of the, some guitars in the, with P90s, you'll have to notice that too. Some guitar pickup combinations, it's just perfect, uh-huh. and it doesn't seem to really depend as much upon the resistance or the magnet as much as it does. It just works well with that guitar. The pickup does. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, oh, we've got another question. Um, oh, well, let's go back to the double cream question before oh. we. Go. So. Oh, this- yeah, um, actually, my feeling about this is that I, I'm just only ever going to offer a pickup with a cover, <laughs> so I don't ever have to wade into these waters mm. because uh, it, it is. I mean, it, to it, to me, it, it's uh, you know that cream color. It, actually, interestingly, the cream color is. Uh, I think really a function of the um, what it. I think it has more to do with because they, they made their P ninety covers out of the same material, and I'm sure it's for Gibson. It was just a matter of I'm sure they had that available material to run some of the bobbins, and it wasn't an issue to them. This only became an issue when the, it became uncovered. And people realize these are the cream, double cream PAFs are the least uh, abundant and also 
strangely tend to be the hotter, higher resistance ones. But that's right. I think really a function of the era and the timeline of when they're made. But as far as the DiMarzio cream thing, it, this is sort of, it's like, I, I don't want to poke that bear, honestly, <laughs> because it's, uh, he does have the trademark for it. I'm not the one in charge of handing it out. It, 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 my understanding is the trademark is for exposed double cream bobbins. Mm -hmm. I do find it interesting that their, their language, I believe in the trademark, is that it's for uh, a cream or uh, it's it's as loosely defined as a cream color and knowing working with in photography and with graphic designers that's not how color is defined it's defined with pantone colors with a specific value so it's 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 easily defined and so if it's a trademark color i i would think it needs to be more more specific. precisely defined yeah yeah and interestingly, my experience with it is that um, a real vintage PAF, it varies in color if it's uh, a cream bobbin, depending upon how, how, what environments it's been, it's been exposed to, whether the cover's been off. The color will fade out of it. Sometimes it can get darker. Sometimes it can get lighter, lighter to bone color. And you'll see this with uh, P90 covers as well. Uh, the, it'll depend on whether or not, and I didn't realize this until my plastic molder for the P90 covers pointed it out, but it, it depends on whether or not they Gibson used clear plastic or what's called natural plastic, which is uh, basically the bone color, color as the base material that they added colorant to. And so the, the clear material, butyrate, will tend to darken with age. And the the material that started out um, natural, the color will fade out and it'll turn bone colored. So, but Demar, I I found just from what I have seen of Demarzio's cream color that it's it's generally not in the range that I would expect from a vintage cream color. Right. But but so if, they, if that if that's something they want to define. You know, they're, they're trademark for it. I'm just surprised that there's not a, a clear definition as to what that color is. And I would think that they would want to do that. Um, but, so that well, it was in their case, right, in their them. case, it's pretty broad. So they, they, they've got no competition in that area. Yeah. Is, is, yeah. is, is that one of the reasons why all your pickups, your PAFs are, are uh, covered just to avoid that well, whole, that I, whole issue? Well, there's two parts of that. One is very often we sell a lot of covers because we use a thinner material and cosmetically they're very close to a vintage PAF. So honestly, I, I want, I kind of think it should go with the pickup if you're getting a PAF repro. Um, but the other part of it is, you know, I, I don't want to, I just don't want to get involved in that part of it. And having a covered pickup is a, is a safe way to, to stay away. Stay from yeah. <laughs> and Dave. But I, I, some guys are like, they're incensed by it and they feel it's an injustice that, that, that as far as limiting the market for other people. Mm -hmm. And I guess I can see their side of it. I can see both sides of it. It does. I know part of the argument is too, that, you know, there's many cream parts on a guitar, and uh, it's not unreasonable for a consumer to expect to to find a wide range of aftermarket parts that would match those cream, like the binding and mm -hmm. the rings and other parts on the guitar. But again, I'm not in charge of making the rules on that, so mm -hmm. I'll leave it to others who want to. And Dave, all your your uh, humbuckers are black, right? No, or cream black. Or, or okay, or cream black. Yeah. Gotcha. I didn't. I, I didn't see that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, or or 
And you can always do the way that Duncan has done it for years. It's like if you want a double cream, you can have a double cream, but I'm going to send you a pickup that's covered. <laughs> right. So well, what happened after? I don't know. <laughs> well, we yeah. won't we won't say any more after that. <laughs> I'm sure that goes. Well, on. you know, the, the other part of the cover with with uh, PAF is it affects the tone. There's a reason. Well, yeah. there's, there's a reason people took them off, and there's some re- a reason some people like them on. Mm-hmm. You'd get a different character, and I think you need to have it as an option. If you're, I, my feeling with it is, I'm I'm selling a very expensive pickup, and part of it is the cover. And I, I, I whether or not the person knows it when they buy it, I think they need to have it. And it, uh, frankly, it if they ever want to sell it, it's worth more with the cover. Is, especially to to a potential buyer in the future. Mm-hmm. Oh, the other the other part is, and this actually I wouldn't have actually expected this was as big of an issue, but um, it, it does protect the pickup. I mean, there's a real reason to have it on and uh, the cover on, and I, I'm I'm always surprised by. It, periodically, I'll get pickups back that are not working. And you'll get it. And you'll be like, "Well, this is—it's not working because it needed the cover on. Something's happened that's that's it compromised the coil." And from just from a it now it would be different too if you were wrapping them with a fabric tape, but we use uh, paper tape like the vintage ones, and it's not—it's not real common for them to fail from the coil being compromised, but. It, uh, it's more of a chance through the tape, but but there's just it's upping that chance, yeah. and by having the cover on, you're now making it someone else's. You, you're giving them fair warning, I guess, so that's a possibility. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know one of the common issues with uncovered humbuckers is that your uh, your high E string always gets caught on the yeah, can... the bobbin, right? And then can wreck the pickup. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Not yeah. real. It's not real. Common. It can happen. Um, yeah. Adam Gothridge. Thanks, Adam, for the super chat. He says, John recently played a '64 SG and loved the pickups. Super open and dynamic sound. Can you recommend one of your pickups that might be similar? Thanks. Yes. We have a set called the E again, or. Well, actually, the the naming system makes sense sort of for this. It's called the ESG 102B. And the reason it's named that is that set is based upon a '64 SG we had in the shop that we had for for a while, for weeks we had it here, and we were able to compare against it. Hmm. That set. That era. That era. You will find pickups that are. PAF spec, but lower resistance. That set is, I believe it's 7.3K bridge, 7.5, 7.5, 7.4 neck. But the, it's an interesting combination of specs for that era because they still, some of them still have an internal start wire, which makes the coil fatter for the number of turns hmm. that it would have without the internal start wire. And, but it's also a lower resistance pickup, pickup with short magnets. And that guitar had short A5 in the bridge and short A2 in the neck. And I, I actually have a theory that Gibson did this as a way to, n- not real reliably because uh, their specs are not real consistent, but very often with a P90 and a, um, a PAF. If there's A2 in it, it's very often in the neck pickup. My theory is it's a way to for them to equalize output by putting the stronger magnet in the bridge pickup. That makes sense. Yeah. So, and it does. You do get a little bit more that that difference in in magnet. You'll it'll change. You get a little bit the middle position tones a little bit chimier. I find if those two magnets. Or different, right? That's nice. That's but cool. 
Yeah, for, so for an e, the for a 64 era, the ESG 102B is is our vi- version of that. Okay, cool. Dave, you tired? Literally taking. Mm-hmm. Are you tired? Oh, I was up really early today. Yeah. <laughs> It's not even late here. I was up really early though. I, I hear like you. Five. I hear you. Yeah, it's. I was. I've been up early too. Uh, working really early. Um, well, I've, I've been. I've been down at the factory every day this week. Oh yeah. Every day, getting B one hundred deluxes out the door. Oh yeah. When's when's the official release of that? Twenty sixth. Nice. So, but you know, we start shipping orders ahead of time, so they're you know at the stores for the release. Right, and then inevitably some store will violate the release and sell it anyway. <laughs> it happened with the JJ Junior. It sure did. Yeah, I'm sure it's going to happen any minute with the with the deluxe. It's like when that happens, what's the penalty to these people? Well, you know, sometimes you. What can you do? You know? Yeah, it's like maybe maybe their next order is not going to get there uh, first, right? You know, mm-hmm. yeah. So yeah. interesting, um, but yeah, you know, it happens always. Well, at least there's demand. That's a good thing, but abide by the rules. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Modern Vintage says Tone Talk Friedman amplification. Any Friedman merchandise such as tees and hoodies coming soon. Well, I can tell you right now, if you want a Friedman T-shirt, you can just look up Friedman T-shirt uh, online, and you will see on a Reverb shop, Motor City Guitar has them. Oh. So, um, I mean, I can tell you some too, but right now they have them in stock, and they're selling them online, so it's easy to do. So, uh, so uh, go buy it from my best buddy Marty. So cool. Um, and he's get he's gonna get more too because he's gonna run out because he said they've been going like crazy. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Well, if you guys didn't hear, eventually that. we will have an online shop, but uh, it's not set up yet for our merch, so mm-hmm. we'll let you know when it is. And we'll have other things too, like hoodies and hats and various other stuff. So you want to say again where the where the t shirts Friedman t shirts can be got? Well, right now, uh, Motor City Guitar has them up for sale on Reverb. Okay. So I imagine if you go to Reverb and search Friedman T-shirt, you would find it. Cool. Um, and it might also be going up on their web page, he told me. So. Well, good. BMO, thanks for the super chat. Uh, he says, John, would you consider making an artist series like a Neil Young set like his old Black Gibson or some iconic players? I, uh, well, the thing with that is, you know, it, with a living celebrity, you kind of need their permission. <laughs> so, <laughs> or it could be inspired. Uh, it can be inspired by, yeah, right? No, yeah, that's true. I mean, I do have in most most PAF style picket makers do have something like a Peter Green set. We've got something like that. Mm. I do actually have. This is going to be released this summer. A Paul Kossoff set that is actually based upon the owner of one of his bursts Ooh. having me duplicate the pickups in that. And that's actually, that'll be this summer. I've got, it's all done except it, and it actually has an interesting story that guitar does. And, um, I'll give a, it, so it actually has a, a strangely, um, possible connection to Peter Green's guitar. And I didn't realize this, until the covers came off the pickups on Paul Kossoff guitar. So the, I'll, I'll, at the risk of this being too convoluted, <laughs> I'll give it a shot. No, this is this. We get geeky here. Okay. So, so, so the lore with Peter Green's guitar is it, it has a middle position out of phase tone. Right. And it's distinctive to that, to Peter Green's sound and, and that guitar. And it, the neck pickup in the state it's in now has the magnet flipped. But it also has the uh, braided lead replaced with tel- a two-conductor telephone wire. And the lore is, and there's info to back this up, that 
the that pickup stopped working properly. Peter Green brought it in to, uh, oh, I forget, is it Selmer? But essentially, the person who re- who was who repaired it was a, a, a guy named Sam Lee, who was in England at the time, who did a lot of guitar repair. And this is a, a well-known story, but they was not expert at at um, electronic repair. And the part of the story is that it was reverse wound, and this is why it's out of phase. Peter Green's pickup. The but the reality is that uh, his magnet is flipped on this guitar. So anyway, for this out of fate reverse wound out of phase story, the, the way it was portrayed to me by a contemporary of Sam Lee who talked to me about it is that at the time a Fender pickup was the most likely pickup to fail, and that Sam Lee had form var wire in order to rewind a Fender pickup. And the wind direction that was would have been you expected for a fender fender pickup was opposite of a Gibson, and this is what Sam Lee, who is not experienced at electronic uh, work for guitars, did to rewind that pickup. Therefore, one of the coils is reverse wound, and in his effort to make it work, he got it to work in phase with itself, but ended up flipping the magnet in his effort to get it to work properly. So this is this is my understanding of the story. Okay, so Paul Kossoff's guitar, the one that we made pickups to duplicate with the help of the current owner, his his guitar has a broken neck that's been grafted, and it was grafted by Sam Lee. Um, it, it broke, I guess. Apparently, Paul Kossoff threw this guitar in the air at the last free show. And it landed and broke its headstock, and was subsequently sold, or traded, repaired by Sam Lee, and then went back into Paul Kossoff's possession when he uh, when he um, was doing Backstreet Crawler. This was the the Les Paul that he had until his death. Um, anyway, so it has a Sam Lee repair. Well, the story with with uh, Peter Green's neck pickup, as I understand it, and part of the speculation is that it has one reverse wound coil with form bar wire in it, done by Sam Lee. The bridge pickup in Paul Kossoff's guitar, when the cover's off, it has one pick. It has one. The the bridge pickup has one coil reverse wound with form bar, huh. just like what is supposedly in Peter Green's. So, uh, and the bridge pickup magnets flipped, but the middle position tones in phase. So the the bridge pickup is accidentally wired out of phase. And so whoever did the repair flipped the bridge magnet in order to put it back to normal phase when the two are together. So... From this, it's not unreasonable to assume that um, that repair was pro- likely also done by Sam Lee. Incorrectly, in the same manner that it is speculated to have been done to Peter Green's pickup. You'd be amazed why people kept going back to this guy. <laughs> well, know what the hell it, he's doing. I think the, re- the reality is there weren't many options. Yeah, I guess you know, so. To yeah. repair your electronics at that time. Yeah, that makes and, sense. Um, but the interesting, it does change the signal path, and it is a different sound with having one. Literally, the uh, the coil that is reverse wound on Paul Kossoff's bridge pickup is actually even installed backwards. You can see the form bar wire through the hole on the pickup. Huh. And so it, it it has a little effect. The, the difference in wire has a de- definite effect on the tone of it. And... Uh, you're also changing the signal path as to what it would be normally mm. if it were assembled properly and wound in the correct direction, both coils. But so, anyway, that's that's going to be a signature set that will be released this summer. Okay, cool. So we've got two questions, um, and I think we already answered them. So 
Uh, Cecil Music, uh, John, are you allowed to do double cream bobbins? The answer is no, right? Yeah, Seymour, Seymour, not Seymour, DeMarzio has the trademark for exposed double cream bobbins. Right. And then Dave, when will you put out a 2x12 vertical cab? He said, Dave already said that he's uh, already That's done. Out. I just got to get it into production and then, you know, announce it and release it and all that stuff so i don't have an exact definitive answer for you <laughs> right and ed, ed bauer says we'll do on the t-shirts and guys if you want um tone talk t-shirts i still have got uh, a lot of mediums in stock if you guys are mediums uh so we're get, doing those on sale for 14.99 plus shipping five bucks so uh those are on sale so let me know reach me at tone talk Mark, M A R C at gmail.com. Um, and then Cecil Music says, I imagine he can do double cream under a cover. Uh, well, we won't go there. Um, it, it's a question that never stops, <laughs> even, <laughs> even on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I'm sure. Is there anything similar in the amp world to this? Like, is there some. Is, uh, you're not supposed to do that everybody well not everybody does but um, you can't essentially something that you're like, there's got to be something that's proprietary but off the top of my head i can't think i can't think of anything but there probably is you know there's interesting things too about like um a lot of these trademarks is that some of them are because uh, i believe demarzio has others but some of them are are kind of a byproduct of the assembly process in, mm -hmm. in the 50s, like air gaps and things like that. Well, I know Mezzaboogie yeah. Mezzo Boogie has uh, certain patents on things that... Well, trademarks and patents are a little different. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. runs out, really. fortunately. <laughs> yeah, I get that trademark, too, is it's... Well, it's a trademark. They're they're claiming that that visual look is theirs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I meant patent actually. I think don't don't yeah. they have a patent on certain certain things? On, on they have trademarks on certain circuits. Oh, they have trademarks on certain circuits. Yeah. Okay, so it's not a patent. Okay. Um. Douglas Dog One Super Chat. Thank you. Uh, what differences could be expected? Wait, am I confusing that? I might be confusing that. I thought a trademark was more like the visual aspect. Of trademark it. is what patents run out, correct? Yes, patents yes. run out. Trademarks are forever. I, I think you actually have to renew a trademark, and you also have to show a history of enforcement. I think that's how that works. I, I think they run out of different times. I don't know. I'm not an expert on that. but Yeah, but a patent runs out after 15 years. Yeah, yeah. So I think the DiMarzio is a trademark, isn't it? Yep. Yep, I believe so. Yeah. Huh. And that's based on the visual aspect of it. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, Douglas Dog One, what difference could be expected changing a around 7K Humbucker Alnico 5 bar magnet to an Alnico 4? If any notable, if any noticeable, especially any noticeable difference, especially on an amp set for light crunch. Alnico four. Uh, I guess I need to preface this. Is that my basis for describing the magnets has to do with our magnets? The the reality the real right back. Keep going. Yeah, the reality is that um, that something like like we we offer i offer four different varieties of alnico 5 and they all have a different tonal character um part of that is due to uh, how they're heat treated and the other part is due to the differences in metal mix between manufacturers which in a pickup affects the sound of it primarily through inductance but um so so but ours are usa cast and made magnets most available so our what i my opinion on this is based upon what we have 
uh, made for our pickups. Al, Alnico 4, 5, and 2 overseas made is pretty much as a general rule charges much higher than the domestically made. And that it has an effect on the, the treble response of the pickup. But so what I'm my opinion here is based upon our, our magnets, which are cast for us in the U.S. But Alnico 4 compared to Alnico 5 and oriented Alnico 5, which is the normal spec for Alnico 5. Um, Alnico 4 is going to have a higher disparity between the upper treble and the lower treble, or so the treble content of the low end than Alnico 5 will, an oriented Alnico 5. So in the wrong guitar, in the 7.7K pickup, which it actually 7K to me, if it's a PAF, is I, if, I, if I get a, a pickup in that's vintage that's 7K, I actually usually assume that it's there's something wrong with it. I haven't seen, basically, for me, the lower end of what properly working PAF is, almost always, is going to be, if it's below 7.2K, it's often an indicator something's up with the pickup. Mm -hmm. But... Um, the uh, Alnico 4 it has the potential of having too spiky a treble relative to too weak, too, uh, too little definition in the low end than Alnico 5 will, speaking of the magnets that we have cast. Mm -hmm. um, so that with a, you might notice that as a particular problem in a 7.7K pickup. The 4 might not be might not be uh, might be problematic might not though with your setup though but and five two is going to have a more uh, faster punchier attack than the alnico four mm. will okay thank you so. um tone wars thanks for the super chat i think that's jared uh, there's one before him oh is there yes yeah, stay curious Dave, I like my Mesa amp, but can you tell me why that Mesa amps get muddy when the bass is past three? Why did they design it like this? <laughs> I have no idea. Turn the bass down and use the graphic EQ. <laughs> yeah. If you're talking about a Mark series. Uh, it's always been that way. I don't understand myself. I, it's, don't get, I don't get it. Okay. So there you go. Stay curious. Uh, uh, I got no it, answer. It is something like that? Can it be chalked up to the that whoever does whoever is making the choices prefers single coils? Could be. You could know, be. I mean, or it could I, be. It could be they have no idea of uh, what a good amp sounds like. It could be. <laughs> yeah. Could be. Could be they hear it different than we do. Could be yeah. uh, lots of things. You know. Interesting. So the question from Tone Wars was, uh, please explain clipping in amps and pedals and the benefits. Thank you. Hmm. Well, clipping is anytime you clip anything into distortion. Uh, but I think what you're referring to in pedals is when you're clipping diodes or LEDs or, or, or certain things like that. Um, how do I explain this? The benefits. I, I, I'm I'm probably not the guy to ask. I'm answer. not the guy that I, I don't know if I can really explain this properly. So yeah. I mean, like in a pedal, I mean, if you have a if you have a clipping circuit in a pedal, a way to achieve distortion, essentially, and yeah. there are different ways to achieve distortion by clipping diodes or LEDs. Uh, in tube amps, you're clipping tube stages. You're just seriesing them together to get more distortion but diodes can also be used in amps to do sort of a diode clipping like a silver uh, jubilee, silver jubilee did that right a silver jubilee yes correct my uh, my, my limited experience with it is with the overdrive boost I, I added a clipping diode pair to it and what i found most uh, the, the tone i liked was a, a germanium diode and then a germanium transistor set up as a, a clipping diode. And there was an asymmetry with that that 
gave a character that you did, wouldn't have with just the exact same diode for the clipping circuit. So yeah. maybe a some asymmetry there. I th and maybe it was just sort of the function of, of the two diodes or diode and clipping transistor acting as a clipping diode. But that seemed, I thought, I thought you got a little extra amp-like character out of setting it up that way. But, but that's the only experience I've got really firsthand with it. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I hope we answered your question. Um, Tom Dick. But Harry's not around, so just Tom and Dick. Um, says, Dave, the Oxbox or a Boss Tube Expander, any thoughts? I think another guy kind of explains it a little further down. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I mean, the Tube Expander has more features. Um, probably better suited in a live format. Um, the Ox, man, they're both they're both going to get you great results. Uh, I mean, there's pluses and minuses. There's a there's a great video from Anderton's. Uh, yes, that actually goes that. through both of them. Uh, watch it. That might give you a better idea. Yeah. Yeah, that was actually a good video, and they actually do go into uh, the pluses and Pretty minus. good detail. Yeah. yeah, the pluses and minus. What I, I what I liked about the Boss is that it, it tended to have more. It had the effects in it, you know. Um, but then I also like the fact that the visual aspect of the uh, the ox you had it had Bluetooth, so you could just use your iPad and actually see. But with the uh, with the boss, you had to plug in it, plug it into your laptop or your computer, and use the editor there, plugged in wired. So there's you know pluses and minuses on both of them. I actually really like the power station, the Fryat power station. Um, and then just use some IRs and you'll be good. Um, so here's a question. Bare Knuckle does double cream. How are they allowed? Or is it because they're in another country? Cecil Music. I, I Again, I'm not totally sure on this. I suspect that, the, that Demarcio's trademark is domestic. If that's the case, I assume that's why. But honestly, I, I I couldn't tell you definitively. Okay. Uh, Ed Bauer, Mark, and Dave, you guys should do a run of Tone Talk guitar picks. I've been thinking about doing that actually with the logo and stuff. Look out for it. I'll make. I know the guy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll get some made up. Uh, Evh and Randall Smith, the two people I want to see on Tone Talk, Deja Blue. I'd love to have EVH. Sure. Of course. Uh, don't think that's ever going to happen. Just being completely honest. Um, and Randall Smith is always welcome to come on. Um, uh, you know, Dave, make it happen. <laughs> uh, there'd be some drama if I had Randall Smith on. There probably would be. Yeah. He'd have to be prepared to talk about the Saldano situation. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's we why we had enough trouble with that, didn't we? <laughs> well, yeah, well, there was definitely a lot of drama about that. That's for sure. Hey, hey, hey Dave, I I, th I should probably mention that one reason I like watching the show. I mean, I've, uh, is that I am always intrigued by people's stories as to how they either got into mu making music. Mm -hmm. Or how they got into uh, making stuff that musicians want. Yeah, yeah. How did you make the? Did you gradually make the step into manufacturing, or, or was it, was it something that you kind of like just seemed like the logical thing to do? Um, I moved from Detroit um, in 1987, I believe, 88, 87, 88. And, and that's a little funny now. It's a long time ago. And uh, I went to work for Andy Brower Studio Rentals. 
Yeah. Well, first of all, I was always a guitar player and a musician in Detroit and stuff, and I, you know, played some. I remember playing bars that I shouldn't have been playing when I was 16 years old, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I always had this passion for a- anything I ever did. I always took it apart and try to figure out how it worked. You know, I used to be really into racing uh, BMX bikes and stuff. Mm, okay. uh, so, so I mean, I could take a bike apart and strip it down and put it back when I was got when I was probably twelve. I love you that know? stuff when I was. There's a the kid. Same bikes out of the trash when I was twelve. Yeah, I mean, like I love that stuff yeah. and crazy outside all the time, riding and racing and jumping and just all the time. But I got into guitar, and you know, the, you know, that changed, and you know, I just. But everything I did, I always wanted to learn everything there was to know about it. So, just like you wanted to learn everything there was about how to make this PAF, you know, and yeah. researching it and figuring it out. And it used to be hard. It used to be hard to research things. Yeah. I mean, like you know, information was scarce. You didn't have the internet. You didn't have you know. Yeah, I I remember when I could drive. I, I when I first got my license, I thought, well, now I can call everybody on the phone and try to convince them to show me how they do refrets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I moved. Uh, well, first of all, I had sold a couple old orange cabinets I had um, in Michigan to Andy Brower in California. Okay. Uh, and he said, if if you ever move out here, you know, come see me. So I went and saw him and, you know, you know, I knew him from magazines and different things. And I went to see him and uh, eventually, basically he offered me a job and I went to work for the studio instrument rental company. Now, what that did for me was that um, surrounded me. I already knew amps. Re- I mean, not how to work on them, so to speak, yet, but, uh, you know, I was 18 at the time, so. You, but, you, you knew what you knew what a good one was and what I knew what great I knew about Marshall's yeah. things I knew yeah. what I knew what was up with that but what um, the education of the studio instrument rental company was for me is every kind of vintage guitar every kind of vintage amp I mean there was in, in the in the display room up front it's like there's you know eight blackface fender amps you know uh, from everything Princeton down deluxe mm. Twin, Pro, Vibralux, everything. Tweed stuff, um, Marshalls, modded Marshalls, High Watts, everything known to mankind. Yeah. So what that did for me is I was able to understand and listen to every single kind of amp imaginable. Uh, more so than anyone, no one has heard as many amps as I have, you know? Yeah. If, if you're not, I mean, if you're not surrounded by it all the time, you wouldn't get a chance to hear, what does the Selmer Zodiac sound like? Most people won't know. Yeah. They're, they're more apt to know what a Plexi sound like, and very few people know what that sounds like. Mm-hmm. So yeah. um, it it's, came and gave me a really strong background. So and, you, and you had the opportunity to discover that as a guitar player. Yes. With the exposure to that, okay. Yeah, and yeah. Then working with um, session musicians, delivering their gear. Um, eventually, he had a guy that was making rack systems for people and stuff at the time, and uh, he wound up leaving the company, and I had been watching him. And I'm like, hey, I think I can do that. So I just butted my nose in there and started doing it for Andy Brower, and that just sort of snowballed. So the majority of my career was making systems for famous guitar players. Yeah. Systems, pedal boards, racks. It depends on the era we're talking, you know. This is, career spans a lot of years. Um, and in the early 90s, uh, a client of mine, who a guy walked in who became a client of mine, um, Randy Jacobs, who used to play in Was Not Was. Okay, from Detroit originally, and he brought in the Soldano preamp that Bruce Agnator had modded. I knew Bruce from Detroit from when I was a kid. Yeah, I had amps worked on by him and stuff, and um, 
And I heard this preamp, and I'm like, holy crap. This is amazing. You know, we, you know, I called them up and I go, hey, look, we got to make a preamp. You got to make a preamp. I'm going to help you with this. Let's, let's make a, you know, a four channel guitar preamp. <clears throat> and so we did. And we tweaked it and it w became wildly popular. I helped get it into all the, you know, artist hands and different things. They used it at the time. And it became very popular. And then we moved on to amps. And during that time is when I really learned to work on amps with yeah. from from Bruce, you know, from it's like you said, learning how to do the refret from the guy, you know, like show, yeah, yeah. show what you yeah. do. Well, I learned electronics from starting with him. And um, and then, you know, that just snowballed over the years. You know, I kept doing that. And then I started dabbling in amps and then making my own amps and doing amps with other people and. Yeah, did you did you make a transition then from modding to manufacturing? Yeah. To, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I still mod. Yeah. Yeah, I still mod and do stuff like that. And then yeah, I, 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 I think I think it's interesting because you know obviously, I think so many people will get into this because they have a love for the guitar playing that leads to a love of the the gear. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, like, again, it's, it's, it's like, I'm a little obsessive about stuff and that's, that's what drives me. You know, it's yeah. like no amp I've ever designed is perfect and I'm always second guessing it. Well, it wouldn't be interesting. To I, I'm always second guessing it. Yeah. Maybe I can make it better. And generally I can't, but you know, and sometimes I have to go, wait a minute, everyone likes it. Leave it alone, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, because uh, you know, I'll drive myself crazy. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you. So, when did you go from? Because there was a Friedman line, then you went to boutique amps, right? Well, like any small business, you have capital issues, uh, and uh, if you don't have enough capital you really can't make the company function. Um, so we were, we were making our own amps. Uh, and then George Metropolis was making amps for us right. when it got to be a little bit bigger than our, well, we lost one of our builders and then just like George, you can make them for us and which worked out pretty well for a while. But then we got to a point where we needed more amps than he could deliver. And, and it's still, a money thing you know it's like if you don't have a couple million dollars in the bank yeah it's hard to float a company to do numbers you know onesies twosies sure you can do that but um it's hard and that's where most small businesses get into trouble they don't have the capital and then they get in trouble they start you know if they take deposits then the owner is you know paying his rent with the deposit and then you're paying catch up and then it's this whole ugly mess that winds up happening, and then everyone gets pissed at them. You yeah, know? just yeah, put the, it simply and quickly. In, in the pickup world, the sort of the classic story is that someone gets recognized as making a great pickup, and then they quickly get a backlog of orders. And WB the, pickups. It, what? There was a company called WB pickups. Oh, there's 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 you know about them. Oh, yeah. There's countless numbers of guys that this has happened to. And then they get uh, such a backlog a year, year and a half, that I, I, they either start losing track of who needs to get what. And it snowballs into a death spiral for some of them. Yeah. 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 Or if they take in a deposit, they spend the money, and yeah. it's just. Yeah, starting out with uh, when I, even when it was, uh, this was a, uh, a side business for me, I, it just became apparent very quickly that having a waiting list was creating a whole new level of work and distraction mm -hmm. that I vowed that I'm just, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, you know, so if someone orders from us, it's made to order, but it leaves within five days, five business days of getting the order. And uh, that's great. 
Yeah. That's awesome, yeah. And if it's a guitar company, we're shipping within two weeks of getting the order. So places like Collings order pickups from us and can reliably get them quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're probably one of the few boutique, sort of highly customizable makers that can turn that around, that size order around that quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think the practice of just committing right off the bat to never having a backlog that that became unmanageable kind of trained me to make sure I had the parts on it. This was really why I decided to have all my own part. A large part of me deciding to have my own parts manufactured is that having to deal with um, a parts supplier that's uh, for for your your materials, it, it can quickly get you into trouble. So sure. every, all of our parts are either every, every piece of the pickup is either done with our tooling, uh, molded with our mold. The only thing that I haven't paid to have made is the the black paper tape. And that's yeah. because and that's because I can't find anybody that will do it. Yeah, <laughs> back of the old stuff. Yeah, that's funny. But yeah, they, they, this went too. When I went to just being the manufacturing part of the of the business, it really did take me a year and a half, two years to realize that uh, it, it's just uh, the the way you handle money, capital, and your time is completely different than if you were then a service business and i think that's the other part of it too um maybe with pickup makers it, it, it there's there's a hundred there's probably over 300 pickup makers and many of them make very nice stuff but it's a it's become a cottage industry literally people making them in their house but they're they're very often dealing with the same bucket of parts because they're buying from the same sources mm -hmm. and if there's a hiccup in that supply chain it quickly affects all of them yeah sure yeah yeah sure. that's why we in our fashion we we make almost everything so all yeah. the cabinets are made at our factory all the uh you know it's all the toll waxing is done there all yeah. the panels that go on the amplifiers are are printed there and and laser cut there yeah. um, and, and you can make them as you need them rather than having to correct and we can also tell like something custom for someone quickly yeah and it's not really a big deal to to do that um but it also controls the supply yeah so we're never oh the cabinet maker said he was going to deliver the cabinets oh. on tuesday and now it's friday and they're still not here yeah. And I got amp chassis sitting here done and guys sitting around not doing anything that I'm paying. Yeah. I, I so. yeah, having my own parts made, I did not realize how like finding a good supplier is like discovering gold. <laughs> it, it's because it solves so many problems. Oh, he's on time. Wow. Like, literally, if you're the guy that supplies what you or supplies what was ordered on time. Mm. It, it solves so many problems, it, which uh, it actually, which I just sort of informed too how to handle your own customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, yeah. If, if you're the guy that can supply reliably and re reliably supply what you're what you're advertising and on time, it, people like that. I like that <laughs> with the supplier, yeah. and it, oh my, it, it, there's so many, so many things that can be avoided by, by having a good supplier. No doubt. Bad. Yeah. And then they have a bad supplier, and they can totally screw everything. Oh, it can immediately mess up everything. Yeah, yeah. That's that's why, yeah, having a good supplier mm -hmm. is great. And then you have a hiccup, and you're like, fuck. Um, yeah. So Peter Urban. Uh, thanks for the super chat. Thanks for a great show, he says. We appreciate it. Um, thanks, Peter. 
Here's an interesting question, and I've wondered this myself because I'm a left-handed guitar player. Um, I think I know the answer to it, but I'm just going to let you guys answer. He says, uh, I'm left-handed and looking into finding new pickups for my Strat. Can Southpaws use any pickup, or are there issues? Love the show. Do you, do you want me to answer that one? Sure, go ahead. Okay. In Theoretically, it should make no difference. The reality is, for some of our pickup models, with PAFs, one of the specs that varies in vintage PAFs is the steel, uh, the carbon content of the steel pole screws. So, depending upon the model, that may be a spec that we mix and match uh, different seal content pole screws you would not know by looking at them in order to uh, affect the the treble response of individual it doesn't of individual strings it has broader effect than individual strings because it doesn't see, it seem to only affect the individual the one string but depending upon the model with our stuff it's actually useful for me to know if you're a left or right-handed person Hmm. player because it may affect for that model what order we put the pole screws in interesting that, now that that would have been you would with a vintage pickup that would have been if there was that variance that would be random but it would be random to that pickup and but so my my approach when making this stuff is there's random variables in the vintage stuff that affect the sound of it. Um, yeah, weren't there a lot of random things in yeah, the vintage pickups? Yes, the, 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 <laughs> the, the pickup, the interesting thing about a PAF is there's a lot of little parts and the specs change. Yeah. And cumulatively, individually, they might have a small effect. Cumulative, cumulatively, though, if you control them, they have a more pronounced effect on the finished pickup. So my approach has always been that I, uh, so for the pole screws, for example, I've tested vintage ones and I know what the range of carbon content is. So I made four varieties of pole screws, which seems nuts because I have to order 20 to 40,000 of each of them to get it. (laughs) But, but it has a subtle effect on the treble. So I use this as one of the variables I can control for different pickup models and for something like the magnet wire a vintage uh, paf may have the way wire was sorted in the 50s 42 gauge was 42 gauge and it's a tolerance uh, in both uh, ohms per foot and outside diameter that variable in the 50s was if you order 42 gauge you got whatever was supplied to you in that tolerance now they offer it in min to nominal tolerance and nominal to maximum within 42 gauge. So a lot of pickup makers choose min to nominal in order to make it more consistent for them to uh, to wind pickups model to model. What I do is I get the full range of tolerance and then I measure with a micrometer, sort it with a micrometer, uh, check the ohms per foot, and then I assign that specific spool to a specific machine that I know that station always gets that wire and that station is used for these pickups. So I'm, I can build in this random random variable that you find in the 50s, but I can make it repeatable ah. with different pickup models. Mm. And it has a, something like that has a subtle effect on the attack of the pickup. And it, it's one of those many things that you can control and have a finished pickup that is different. This is one reason I have a variety of models. I, I manipulate these random variables in, in a controlled way to affect the character of it, of the, of the finished pickup. Mm-hmm. And I, since I have enough of these older machines, I, I've got two Lisona 102s, they have three stations, so I can afford to have them set up for different spools of wire and have whatever uh, unique properties there might be minor variances and like wire um, guide difference between different models of machines and 
tolerance within the traverse but mm -hmm. i can i can have those six stations between two machines set up with different wire within that within the 42 gauge tolerance and then i can build pickups that take advantage of those without me having to juggle those differences without me having to juggle spools on one winding station wow so that i do that with with most of the machines that we well i sort the wire and assigned to specific stations for all the machines gotcha uh for people watching make sure you hit the subscribe button we got uh almost 140 people watching right now um so thanks for joining everybody who's watching by the way hope your friday's going good um we have a, a question from deja blue freeman guitar is going to do a neck through you got the neck through master <laughs> um <laughs> don't know <laughs> uh i guess that's possible in the future yeah sure Yes, we do have the neck through master, don't we? It seems logical that we would. <laughs> it does seem logical, right? I think we should make the Concord. Oh, dude. With the amount of problems that I... <laughs> no, think... no. With slightly rounded corners. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The slightly edged off pointy corner. Yeah, it's a little bit thicker, too. So. <clears throat> yeah. But yeah, that would be cool. That's for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. We're still, you know, we're still building the guitar division. So uh, I mean, um, we shall see. She'll see what comes next. Cool. I'm not sure. Well, I saw the NoHo uh, 24, and that was killer guitar. Yeah, that that's that's apparently a, a big hit. If we could just produce them all. Oh, they're hard to produce. No, no, it's just they've been slow coming out. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Um, Dan Pfeiffer says, what about John Marshall on Tone Talk? Formal metal, metal church guitarist, Metallica Tech, has worked at Boogie, seems like a great guy. Huh, I don't know. Uh, neither do I. If you know him, Dan, send him, send him our way. Um, so I was going to ask you, John, so like you mentioned, there's – a ton of pickup manufacturers. Um, I think I know the answer already because you've said a lot of these things that kind of differentiate you got, you know, your company versus others. But what would you say is like, you know, the big differentiator? Why would some, why should somebody come to Throwback for your stuff versus, you know, well, Duncan well, or somebody? There, well, there's a, there's a lot of manufacturers that that make nice stuff. There's so. Then you, you you kind of can dial down that number by the number of manufacturers that can make 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 them at any volume that they can reliably ship them to either uh, a dealer or a guitar manufacturer in any quantity. That drops the number way down. Um, so as as far as someplace like Seymour Duncan, who who's honestly kudos to him he's like a model for anybody i think that wants to do pickup making he's so he's a nice guy he obviously has done something right with yeah. his business. he he makes great stuff he's he he's he, years ago he bought a stone bender for me he, this shows how much of a nice guy he is he 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 called me he called me and said hey i hear you make a great tone bender clone I, I want I want one to, for some recordings I'm doing with Jeff Beck's Esquire that I have, and I said he said just uh, sure I, I said sure he said okay I'll mail you a check that's great and he emailed and then he emails me at, you know a month or two later the recordings he did with it of him just playing guitar yeah <laughs> very nice man who else who else does that I mean it's great so. Yeah. So, um, but they're making, so a place like Seymour Duncan makes great stuff, but I, I don't think that they can afford to offer what they're making and controlling the parameters we're controlling with the sorting of wire. And um, yeah. also they, they, 
they've made choices in the manufacturing that that I recognize having paid attention to this as a manu manufacturing um, that speed up their assembly time um, that I don't do because I know in order I, I know that that has an effect if I'm making a vintage repro. So it's someone who wants very precise uh, reproduction in, in mechanical in uh, material specs, mechanical specs, um, in cosmetics. That is that is one detail that differentiates us from from someplace like Seymour. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I don't know that they can they can realistically control. Well, it, it said this in some of the things that we pay attention to. Partly because you have to, um, you kind of have to have the same people doing that process, but also just as one example, um, in order to really tightly control the resistance of the pickup, you really need to measure the wire and you also have to manufacture them in a space that's tightly controlled for um, temperature, for the resistance really to, to be meaningful. And we do that. I'm sure Seymour does too, to some extent, but the, if he did it, more, the the level we do it would would have to raise the price, and they've they've made decisions not to do that that are totally reasonable. Mm -hmm. But so our approach has been just add that extra level of accuracy, and it does add up to a little to a tone difference. I mean, the way I look at it is your your pickups are specifically targeting exact PAF reproductions yeah. Yeah. Uh, of various eras of PAFs, um, and I guess strap pickups too, and tellies, right? You do yeah. Tell, yeah. Yeah. yeah we and do. I mean, if you're looking for a vintage exact PAF style pickup, then you know John would be a great choice. Um, if you're looking for um, a metal pickup or something, or something that's out of the box or different than that vintage pickup. Yeah. Then you know you might look at our buddy uh, Wade Motor City. Oh sure. He, yeah. does, he does those those kind of things great. Yeah. Um, and and also very you know very cares a lot about what he's making and how he's making it and you know parts he's using and such. Uh. You know, and then Seymour Duncan also, you know, for the boutique, ma you know, for the masses, I mean, Seymour Duncan does a fantastic job, and they do all sorts of styles of pickup with all sorts of styles of wire yeah. and winding and magnets and things that where your company is specializing in yeah, I'm, I'm, re repros. Yeah, I'm So trying, it's very different. It's different. Yeah, I'm trying to focus on a very small... Yeah. Window. And 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 by no means is it to say that you can't use totally different parts and totally different things uh, with the way you wind it and get a great sounding pickup. Oh sure, because yeah. you can. You can take you know here's the rest here's the ingredients I have to work with my recipe, and I got to see what I can make out of these ingredients. Okay, and you can make a good sounding pickup. So it will it won't be an accurate PAF. But it doesn't mean it's a bad sound. Oh no, 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 no. So yeah, and part, so, of the, part of the cool thing I found with doing this is that it's a much smaller sort of business world than you'd expect. So you meet people like Wade and and uh, uh, Wolf McLeod and other pickup makers and manufacturers that that you're ha you're or eager to help you in a sort of a co-mutual way yeah yeah you know everyone should be friends yeah you know I mean, that's how i look at it. yeah friends and the, there's information that that they have to share mm -hmm. and that i have to share that would benefit sure. both of us or you know the both parties and um that's it i was i'm i'm was pleasantly surprised that that's part of the fun of yeah of what do you know fun. yeah yeah oh okay well here's what i know 
<laughs> yeah, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. That's what I love about. That's, that's the fun. That's the fun part of it too, and that's how I feel about you know. I have so many friends in the in, in this in these boutique ant making world, you know, and I feel the same way. I make my product, and uh, but I'm friends with Stevie Fry Ed and Mike Soldano and Bruce Agnator and and George Metropolis. And they all make products, and I say try them all. And you know what? The guitar player is going to buy his favorite. Yeah, you're not you're not going to force him to buy yours if he likes that one. Mm-hmm. Well, so yeah. I, I'm always saying it's just here's what we have to offer and let the consumer decide what he likes the best. Yeah, and part, and, of, part of dude that I, I have to believe that almost everybody has gotten gotten into this partly for the love of gear, right? Yeah. Right. Sure. So, Music gear, yep. So you you want it you want to have other people's gear. Yeah, I think part of the fun of it. <laughs> I think I have to say a shout out to to what I would consider one of the uh, I guess Seymour Duncan. Okay, let me rephrase this. Uh, Seymour Duncan and obviously Demarzio were some of the first replacement pickups on the market. Um, not sure who came first. Is it Demarzio? I think it's Demarzio. I think it's Demar. Right. Uh, but for boutique small manufacturers. One of the first people that were really doing great pickups was Lindy Fralin. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Lindy made some amazing strap pickups. Um, Killer strap pickups. And I still yeah. say anything he makes sounds good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whether it's exactly what you want or not, okay, whatever. But anything he I, – I, I'll guarantee anything you pick out of his, you'll like the sound of. It's a, it's a good pickup. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sort of like in the boutique world – yeah, Lindy Fralin and Lawler have made a very yeah. good. Story. Well, Lindy was the yeah. first. Yeah, like the first guy. You know, I remember that's like one of the first ones that were out of the gate, making these vintage Strat pickups and later humbuckers and stuff. But, um, and he was good at it. Still is good at it. Yeah. Well, uh, he, he does a yeah, good job. I think yeah. He I'm, I I do my own website and have some of the benefit of knowing how to track people's traffic, he's still doing quite well at it. Yeah. For yeah. good reason. Yes. Yeah, for good reason. And, and, you know, I think I think actually it's actually quite easy to order a pickup from him, too, on the way his website's yeah. set up and stuff. And mm-hmm. Just go on there and do your specs and boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom, boom. You're done. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't have any direct experience of, of uh, ordering from him, but I have to believe that he's, a, he's, he's one of these guys that you're reliably getting good – stuff all the time from super nice guy too yeah, yeah we, we, yeah, should, we yeah. need to have him on too last stand. yeah he'd be a great guy to have on yeah that'd be a good one yeah we should be have fun. yeah i I, yeah, had, I should try to reach out to him i got a pair of his strat pickups a long long time ago the guitar is long gone and the pickups but i remember putting them in and i was just like oh this is what a strat should sound like <laughs> yeah. yeah they're great yeah they're great and he had all sorts of different flavors of them too so yeah, he used to make this one set of pickups called Woodstock Sixty Nines for. Uh, th- this was in the mid '90s when he first came out with them. So they're reverse staggered magnets and stuff, and uh, and the the, the well, uh, using a purple wire. I, all I remember is a, it's a purple wire that was uh, uh, that was you know characteristic of a, a pickup from that era, '68, yeah. '69. Would be the uh, yeah. yeah. And um, man, those pickups sounded cool. The reverse staggered magnets and stuff—they sounded great. Really like that that set. He stopped making them later, but huh, I never heard of them. He'll still do the same wine, but he, I don't think he does the reverse staggered magnets anymore. Um, I don't know why he stopped making them. Actually, they were great pickups. You know, I don't. I don't know that this is why, but the. Um, I mean, it's not really related to that, but we've been doing Strat pickups. We're coming out with Telecaster pickups um, this summer. In fact, we're doing our first order for our Jap- uh, distributor in Japan for Telecaster pickups. But the reality is, uh, with the, you know, it's such a, a, a Fender style pickup is wire magnets. Yeah. Compressed, uh, you know, Vulcan fiberboard. 
but the choices for magnets has that much more of an impact on the sound. Yeah. And the, the cost of USA magnets, which is what we use, is now so much more than overseas that um, I, I, I wish that, the, that I could find stuff that sounded exactly like the USA made. Yeah. But they sound different. And oh, yeah. That, sure. that might inform, you know, it, could, it may be, I'm sure makers have to make a choice about that at some point i've decided to stick with you know the interesting thing though is 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 like i think in in making some pickups myself uh even if you're using an overseas source for a magnet you might wind up using a different magnet than you would think yeah. you would use yeah. so maybe instead of using an alnico 5 you use an alnico 3 or alnico 2 or to get the same result so you have to you have to take what you're going to use and make the recipe work. Yeah, the, the kind of. and, and and again, you're not going for like with myself with my pickups. I'm not going for vintage accuracy at yeah, all. Yeah. So I'm going for something that I like the tone of. The, the, um, fr the frustration I had now, maybe it's different now, but the frustration I had years ago with overseas was that I would order a batch, mm -hmm. and be very happy with them, and then the next batch I would order would different. Be different material different di they would look different even and they would be ground to a different spec and wouldn't work i'd have to send them back for regrinding and i came to the conclusion that what i was getting was from that uh, that i thought i it was probably likely that when i was placing an order i was dealing with someone who was then going on to have the lowest bidder make them in china mm -hmm. And that lowest bidder would very often be different from order to order. Right, right, right. And so you, you couldn't reliably count on this. At least I couldn't reliably count on this the spec that I needed. Yeah. And they did seem to charge higher for whatever reason. I don't know if that's a, it may be because of heat treating process differences or or differences in the base metal mix that they use. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. And there's way to, ways to deal with that, but. Um, it, for for a, a repro, and you can make great sounding pickups with the overseas stuff. But I found for a repro, it I can actually send a magnet here locally to uh, Thomas and Skinner or Arnold. Used to be Permanent Magnet, which is out of business now. But I can send them a magnet. They'll grind it down, put it in a vacuum chamber, and do an X-ray spectrograph, and I can get that magnet. Right. And they have a lab, and there's a guy that I can call and talk to on the phone, and he'll explain to me what it is and why it. I mean, I've sent magnets that I was I could have sworn were on short Alnico five, and they're like, I've sent it, and they know they're Alnico two, and this is why. This is the metal mix, and it, but it has had a different heat treating process to affect mm. the strength of it. Oh, so, man, there's so much to this, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm trying to imagine doing that now reliably from order to order yeah. with an overseas source. I don't no. feel – I wouldn't feel as comfortable with that. Oh. Oh. Interesting. But that's not to say that you can't, you can't uh, get uh, something that they have as a standard offering and get something that works great for, for your application, you know, and making a great – will make a great sounding pickup. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a uh, super chat from Modern Vintage. Dave, what, where is the feel in amp design? Seems like something only you focus on. Other amp sounds <clears throat> meh and lack feel dynamics. Why is this? Um, I, well, I agree with you. Um, how do I explain it, though? Uh, feel in amp design has to do with uh the frequencies uh, okay i don't have a lot of bass in my preamp sections of my amps um i find putting too much bass in the preamp section causes it to sort of lose uh it gets farty and it loses um loses sort of uh clarity and 
even loses some sustain if it starts to get farty. It kind of, it's kind of a, it's hard to explain feel. Uh, it has to do with filtering and amplifiers. It has to do with how you're voicing the preamp section of the amplifier. Uh, I also generally voice stuff at low volumes when I do it. Uh, I kind of equate that to like if you're mixing a song, which I've done quite a bit of over years, uh, you mix at low volumes, you turn it up, it sounds great. You mix at high volumes, you turn it down, it doesn't. Uh, so I'm always looking for that kind of cranked up vintage. For me, the, the, the quintessential amp is uh, an old 50 watt plexi that I have that I run with a Variac and basically run it on 10, every, pretty much everything on 10. Uh, you know, that Van Halen sort of thing. And that kind of amp gives you, like, it, because it's on 10, gives you this sag and this this bounce and this feel that only a vintage amp does. So the goal was to sort of capture that tone, uh, but with any volume, with, you know, like, so the BE channel, uh, if you set the EQs properly and you can mimic the tone of that amp, uh, quite well at a lower volume, but you also mimic the feel. And a lot of it has to do with how the amp's filtered and how your choices of tubes and your choices in the preamp, really. Mm. And what's the difference between an amp that happens to sound really stiff versus one that's, that's kind of Generally saggy? Generally one that's really stiff has too much filtering in it. Um, which I think robs the life out of everything. It's almost like putting, have you ever listened to an amp in a super dead room? Meaning something that has carpet on every wall. Mm -hmm. You listen to any amp in, in a room like that and it sounds awful. It just sounds horrible. Uh, you listen to an amp on a nice wood stage in a, in a bigger room and the amp sounds glorious, you know? And uh, um, Yeah, I I, I always find that the the real test is what does it sound like at low volume and at stable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even with pick, pickups, that's uh, I practice with my band every week, and I'm always surprised how much the volume you're playing at affects it. Oh and, sure. Yeah, as far as what the feel is. Uh huh. Know that you notice it as much with a recording, but you definitely feel it with you feel the difference playing. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, I've always assumed filtering is a is a big part of that. Yeah, filtering in your amp definitely. Uh, the lower the filtering, the more saggy the amp is. Yeah. There's a there's sort of a fine line between too tight and too saggy. So it just kind of it's uh yeah too saggy at higher volumes can sometimes. Yes, that doesn't work, but sometimes yeah. at lower volumes, and you know I think. I think ultimately people these days are playing amps at lower volumes in general. Yeah. yeah. So you want to try to sort of capture that feel. I've actually also been thinking about something a lot lately. And I've been wondering how to incorporate it. A way that when you play at lower volumes, you can... Uh, when you play at lower volumes, you can actually goose your bias so it runs hotter or your tubes run at a hotter current because you're not pushing them. You're not pushing the tubes. Yeah. Um, at a loud volume, if you're playing really loud, you're pushing these tubes crazily, and there's no way you can set that bias like that. I'm almost wondering if there's a way I could make that to track with a master volume to change the bias as you change it. I, I mean, there's a way to do it. I, I yeah. just, uh, I just, I was yeah. just thinking about that the other day, and I'm like, I wonder how that would work. I, mean, I should try that. <laughs> yeah, I did that with the deluxe reverb. I mean, I adjusted a deluxe reverb, and then I was playing it to where I thought it, it, where it, it sounded right for me, and at a gig, it was red plating. <laughs> and I was like, I guess that's not working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hey, we just got a we have very, very wow. We have a very large super chat. Yes, that just came. Thank you, Chlorine Bacon Skin. Uh, thank you, Chlorine. Thank you very much. Uh, 
So I, I definitely have to answer this well. <laughs> <laughs> Opinion on slaving amps. I love to slave amps. I, I, I did that for the vast majority of my younger youth. I slaved my Marshall, uh, meaning loading an amp down and powering back up with a power amp. That's what I did. That's sort of what my amps mimic. Um, so if uh, you're looking to do that, I would highly recommend uh, a Fry at uh, Power Load. Uh, his uh, load is quite good. And, uh, and then you could use a variety of amps. You have to figure out which amp best suits you. Um, but uh, it's a great tone, especially if you're using more of a vintage Marshall or something. You can really just dime the thing and and go for it. I mean, that, that's a great way. Similar to what the boss, uh, you know, the boss, um, the new boss thing does. What is it? Tube, tube amp, <laughs> Sorry for tube that. amp expander. Tube amp expander does. Similar to what the Fryette um, power station does. It has a built-in power amp. But you can get just their power load and then use whatever power amp floats your boat, you know, whatever one you like the tone of best. Um, it's a great way to do it. If it's a high-gain amp, you might not need to do that kind of thing. But if you're talking vintage amps like high watts, Marshalls, things like that, that that, that really derive their tone from, from cranking it, uh, it's a great way to go. So, so someone says that's not U.S. dollars. It's not as big as it seems. And then, uh, well, okay. And then someone said that's thirty-two cents in dollar currency. Really? <laughs> it's thir three dollars and twenty-two cents. Okay. Well, either way. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't pay attention to what it was. It looked like there was a dollar sign next. That's to what it. I thought. Yeah, but <laughs> that's fine. Either way. Retract my whole thing then. <laughs> 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 that's so funny. Sorry. Uh, uh, either way, that's that's cool. Um, I didn't. I, what does NT mean? I don't. I don't know what that is. Sure. Is it news? Cecil Cecil asks, uh, "What's your thoughts on tube versus solid state rectifiers?" Um, not too much different, to be honest. Um, solid state rectifier, a little bit saggier, a little less voltage. Uh, surprisingly, not as much difference in tone as you would think. A little saggier. Mm -hmm. Not huge, though. So B. Mo's asking, Fryad has tubes, does the Japanese. I guess he means does Boss. I don't think the Boss tube amp expander has tubes. No. And neither does the uh, Ox. No, but the Ox is not uh, the same thing. The mean? aux is a power attenuator uh, or a load, but uh, it's not. You're not loading down your amp and then powering it back up with the power. Right, 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 right. Gotcha. Yep. So uh, it's different. Uh it's Taiwan Taiwan dollars. All right, that's cool. Oh, that's fine. It's fine. There we you. go. Thank well, you. I, I thank you for guys to you know you guys are on it. Thank you. <laughs> so Frank Quinn, we're not on it. We just see a hundred dollars and go, "Wow!" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Hey, now we can buy more than a hot dog. <laughs> can I have I a free? Actually, can I have a Freeman Dirty Shirley for NT three thousand, please, Dave? <laughs> that's too funny. Um, no. Sure, if you pay me money. <laughs> uh. Did John talk about why he focuses on the 64 and 64 Strat pickups? I meant 63 and 64. Okay. Okay. Uh, I focus on those because it's a transition year for two things. The wire that the, the Fender uses, and they're also transitioning to machine wound. So the there's a, a, a little crossover there where you they have a form bar wire machine wound pickup and a plain enamel and that that so i'm i'm playing with those specs and like form bar yeah i i like form bar is a classic um strap tone and form bar machine wound it, it, when they're machine wound you're basically getting a more efficient coil 
they have so if a form bar pickup from that era is a bit more powerful than a uh, hand guided yeah. uh, equivalent resistance pickup that's maybe earlier. So I wanted to concentrate on that that transition point. Gotcha. Got it. That yeah. makes sense. So it, if people like them. I, no, I, you're offering you're offering basically a form bar pickup or a, well, sixty three form bar, sixty four yeah. plain enamel, uh, That's and cool. with that transition, the the resistance goes down a bit, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's it's an interesting transition that. So what's the form bar resistance? 6.3, 6.3, and 6.6. I figured, yeah. And uh, the plain enamel is 6.0 6 neck and bridge, although I offer a hot 6.5 bridge if someone wants that, mm -hmm. and a 5.8 neck, or uh -huh. middle, middle position. And they're just two distinct flavors with, with, the, the, with the machine wound spec. And I don't know, it's, it's kind of a cool spot. Um, I'm going to offer a 59 back that's going to have different magnets and be uh, hand guided also. What magnets are in your pickups? That... The, the, the 63 and 64 uses Thomas and Skinner magnets that I sent some vintage samples to them to duplicate. Is that Alnico? Alnico 5. Oh, okay. Alnico 5. The, um, the, the 59 is going to use Alnico 5 from Arnold, but it's an entirely different spec and sounding different ma sounding magnet. Hmm. Okay, so, cool. Yeah. yeah they even cool. look different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they even look different. Yeah. I mean, the process in making them is, a, is different enough that the, the actual color of the magnet material is different. Oh, okay. So someone cool. asked earlier, and I, I lost my track in the chat, but um, about degaussing de pickups, do you do you deal with that or the um, okay? So Gibson used a a that charged their own magnets using a DC setup with car batteries. It was not real reliable, hmm. and you don't get fully saturated magnets with the method that they use for doing it. And in something like a P90 over time, so I didn't even realize that this was an important spec until uh, an engineer at, um, I think it was Permanent Magnet, explained it to me. But if it's not fully sat, if the Alnico is not fully saturated, it's more prone. And if it's not fully saturated right off the bat, it's more prone to losing charge over time, <clears throat> even if you then decide to degauss it. So... But the method that they used, Gibson used, didn't fully saturate the magnets. So in something like a P90, where both magnets are touching the keeper bar, you don't have a lot of steel to draw that charge. And over time, the, the, the magnets lose a bit of charge because they were never fully saturated. And that's part of the tone of the vintage 50s era P90. Um so we use that same method to charge the magnets, and some of them we we degauss, but it's essentially to mimic that same um, that same effect of not having a fully saturated magnet to begin with. Hmm. Okay. And the the way I found out about the the charging was I talked to one of the guys at Heritage who. One of the machines I had was made by a pattern maker at Gibson, and he said this guy also was the guy who set that set up their charging setup, and he explained it. It was car batteries <laughs> to charge magnets. I, a lot of the <laughs> yeah, it, a lot of the what I find interesting about a lot of the the, the details is when you start actually manufacturing the parts. And you talked, you read things of, like there's an interview, interview Seth Lover uh, did with Seymour Duncan. Mm -hmm. There's things in it that don't make sense. Like one of them is that uh, uh, Seymour Duncan says the or Seth Lover says the spec for uh, PAF was to fill the bobbin, which seems like an odd spec. But when you actually have the machines and you realize that 
that one machine can only make a pickup that will go up to 7.7 K literally it, the way it's set up, you can't get more wire on the bobbin. And then yeah. another machine could do a high nine K pickup. Well then that spec of fill it till it's full. Yeah. Makes sense to tell an operator that might you be using multiple machines. Yeah. So they're, so they they were very practical, I think, about how. Fill it till it's full. <laughs> yeah, so, and and they weren't really thinking oh, this is going to affect the sound. They were like, this is what works for manufacturing these. Yeah, right, right, right. And Just but slap it together essentially with. Well, ultimately, you know, here we go. Fill it to the thing, and yeah, ultimately, a lot of these variations have to do with that. Yeah. Right. And the variations make absolute sense when you realize how they were making them yeah you know and and so the car batteries that was a simple solution to getting them charged and they can get them you can get them cheaper if, they, if you charge them yourself another solution that they had was how do you make lacquer dry faster well you use straight lacquer that's unthinned and you put a, a hot water heater in it to thin it never mind the explosive hazard yeah <laughs> but uh you know it's a practical solution interesting uh we got a couple super chats uh from wyatt willis dave why not do something similar to the sir sl amps where they have low power variac mode and rebiases the tubes also yeah. god yeah i mean also how do i get the be to sound like a 50 watt dimed my 50 watt dime dam. Well, essentially on the low power variac thing, yeah. If I offer a variac in an amp, I would do exactly that. Um, we did do that with the Metro Friedman that I produced for a while with George Metropolis, uh, where we we did exactly that. Um, and as far as how do you get the BE to sound like the 50 watt? I don't know. Approximately mids on eight. Treble on six or seven, bass on like three or four. Wow, um, that's bright. Presence, presence on like four. Um, gain on ten on the BE channel, and master. Well, master just taste on that. Hmm. That will approximately give you. Um, that you know mid less bass and more mid-range and everything than you would imagine if you a b it to a real amp real amp yeah hmm. oh. cool um more guitars super chat uh thank you for modern built non-vintage amps would you still recommend a device like an amp rx brown box to safely bring voltage to 117 or below 120 to 124 uh yes um but you don't need a brown box you can just get a variac well you can get a variac sure uh brown box is cool though uh because it gives you the voltage readout and stuff um yes you modern amps yeah i mean like if your wall voltage is 126 which in some areas it is mm -hmm. your amp is not going to sound great it's going to sound very strident and kind of bright and just not great. Uh, I find actually more more around 115 is more the sweet spot for almost any amp. Um, uh, yeah. You just I, kind of. I actually yeah. bought a brown box two weeks ago. Yeah. Because I ran across your video today. I had, it's I had, cool, isn't it? Yeah, I had meant to get one yeah. a, a couple of years ago, and I forgot all about the thing. And I bought it, and I, I did a gig with it. Uh, was it month Tuesday? Mm -hmm. And uh, I just dialed it to where it sounded. Like just you can dial it wherever literally it sounded yeah. good to you. Yeah, I dialed it to where I thought it started sounding good, and it was one seventeen. Yeah, go. okay, I, well, that's fine yeah. too. I didn't even yeah. know that that was your your number for it, but well, one seventeen, one fifteen, somewhere yeah. around there, I would think. You know, it depends. I mean, you can also yeah. dial it lower, but. Um, but the higher you get, the worse it generally sounds. Yeah. yeah, like one one twenty three, one twenty four. Some places I've you know people that it's one twenty six, and that's just that's just a lot of stress on the amps. 
And yeah, it was 124 yeah. where we were playing. Yeah, my yeah, house yeah. is 123. Oh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, it, it, out here in L.A., it's never that. It's it's more like 117, 118, 120 max, and it's not more. Yeah. Uh, ever, almost. But a lot of a lot of places I know are way more. So it makes sense to have. Will, will this boss uh, load box thing do this as well that you were talking about, or no? It won't do the voltage. No, it won't, it won't no. do voltage, no. Okay. No. no. I don't think any of them do voltage. Yeah, yeah, no. I think so. I, I just, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think it's good to get, you know, a variac. And then, of course, the other thing is, if you have a variac, and you're going to use that, like, just make sure, uh, measure what's coming out of the variac, also. Yeah, that brown box is so much easier to use than a variac. Because I've yeah, got to see the voltage in and voltage out. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the var the variax heavier. I've got one set up for uh, to discharge magnets with the demagnetizer, so I can control the discharge of it. But I'd rather carry the brown box around with its little handle. <laughs> yeah, know? it's certainly a, a more you portable yeah. device. That's for sure. Um, uh, Cecil Music says, John, what are your thoughts on ceramic magnet pickups? I actually like the way they sound. They're not appropriate for a PAF. But I, there's ceramic magnet pickups that sound very good. Um, uh, these dirty fingers. What? Dirty fingers. Yeah, dirty fingers. Yeah. I, I know they often get a bad rap as being too harsh treble wise, but it's it's a specific sound and they sound good. It's just I don't I don't make any that offer it, but I like the way they sound. Yeah, I mean G and L had. Really G and L had some nice pickups um, that are that are ceramic, and I, I I know there was a question someone asked this uh, somewhere in the chat, and I'm looking for it. Um, but was what do we think about the G and L Z coil pickups? Um, they're cool. Yeah, it was L Scott Music. What do you all think of the G and L Z coils? I I like G and L pickups. They're they're cool, but they're definitely different sounding. What have you heard them, John? Yeah, you know my experience with GNL pickups is really the bass pickups, because mm. uh, the um, Matthew Quayle who works here and also plays bass in the band we're in, loves GNL basses and they all have the, the ceramic pickups and they sound great in a bass. I think maybe the the um, ceramic it, you get the power of it and also maybe there's a little treble benefit to it in a bass. But yeah, I, I haven't honestly played. A guitar that has the Z coil pickups in it, so I, I just can't accurately speak to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do chokes do for the tone of an amp? Furious George said, "Should I install a choke in a chokeless amp?" Um, hmm. I guess it really depends on the amp on what you might or might not hear with a chokeless amp. Uh. uh you know that that's I use chokes for everything, so almost everything uh, except the little amps. Um, so, um, hmm, depends on the amp. You might not hear that much difference, to be honest. You know, I I don't know the the answer for that, but it is. Yeah. It, but does does a choked amp is it a little more dynamically respons responsive? Well, uh, it, it improves the filtering and the power supply, but. Um, I don't, you know, there's a chance that you might not hear a difference. Yeah. But again, this might be very dependent on the amp. So I haven't done enough AP comparisons to be quite honest. Um, so there you have it. Hmm. I'm, I'm useless. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Merkava 2099 said Metro Friedman question mark. How did I not hear of that? Yeah, I have to say I, I that was kind of like when did that happen? There was an actual Metro I Friedman amp? Was an amp made for a while between George Metropolis and myself. It was essentially my take on a Plexi 12 series amp with a Variac. Now what that amp was sort of modeled to do is more of that VH sort of thing. 
So um, I've never seen one used or anywhere. I've never seen. Yeah, it. we didn't make that many, but we did them. Huh. If I had to do it again, now I could do it better. <laughs> well, you should. Well, I could. It's it's a you know it's an ass kicker of an amp though. It was a hundred watt amp with the Variac mode, so it's it's loud. You That's want it. to get that sound. You're gonna need that load device. <laughs> oh, because there's no master. No master, baby. Turn it on ten. Ah, <laughs> there you go. Play it like a man. <laughs> carry it like a man. Yeah. Yeah, carry it like a man. Also, be deaf like an old man. Um. Mm-hmm. Matthew Newton. Well, you asked John about that gold top behind him. Yeah, we were t- we were commenting about that earlier. Oh, that that that's a um, I I pro- well this that's a sixty nine small headstock gold top. Nice. And the, the, actually, the story. This is a guitar that most people. This is a story with it. But my 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 vintage guitars always are the ones that no one wants. Because that's the only ones I can afford. This thing, it's um, it's kind of an oddball in the sense that it is um, a small headstock '69. The way you know it's a '69 is there's a little uh, circular stamp on the control cavity inside that I think it has an R. And then if you look in the pickup cavity, there's a tiny veneer between the maple top and the mahogany. It's not like a sandwich by pancake body where it's between the two pieces of mahogany. It's between the uh, the the maple top and the uh, the mahogany. But anyway, this guitar was on someone years uh, maybe five, six, seven, maybe eight years ago. Someone posted that guitar from Craigslist on one of the uh, Les Paul or my Les Paul forum, and w- and it was someone pleased by this guitar. Hmm. And what it was is it was in the state it was in, it had a mini humbucker in the neck, which it should have actually been a P90, and then a mini humbucker in the bridge, and the bridge pickup, someone abandoned routing it for a P uh, for a humbucker, so it had this awful curved chunk out of it, mm. and then on the back of it, on the headstock, was a little metal plate tacked over the serial number and under the serial number was the serial number gouged out oh so this is a probably stolen guitar so i called the guy up so and the the stolen guitars that had once been stolen like this are sort of like orphan forever so i i i thought i'm gonna call the guy up who's listing it the guy called it up was i think this was in somewhere in missouri and he was a corporate headhunter, he said. And he got this guitar years ago, had no idea what the purpose of this plate was until later. And uh, he wanted to sell it because he wanted to just get other gear. So I bought the thing. And then I posted on the forum, I said, I bought it. Now I know it's, and I'm going to put it, whole, make it whole. I'm going to put humbuckers in it. I will play it. I will, I will refret it. And if some, there are distinctive markings, and there are on the back of it that someone prior did and i said if someone can describe those to me i am happy to have it go back to them Hmm. and then everybody on the forum said oh that's my guitar (laughs) and i said oh for the the, there but i said in order to submit what these distinctive markings are there's a small fee of 75 (laughs) dollars and then no one did it so but anyway it's a cool guitar, but poor thing has been sort of a, someone did some, you know, it's a, it's a dubious history as far as the lineage of it goes, yeah. but, but it's cool think, looking. Yeah. It's it looks cool. Great. It's got the patina on it. It's, I like that little green patina on the arm there. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's yeah. got our rings. I, we make butyrate rings with the steel molder or plastic molder who does her bobbins. I had to make a steel mold and, got butyrate material for that so it's kind of like a way you know it's got our pickups and i made the pick guard with material i got from a local guy that used to work at gibson and so i don't know it's, it's it's pretty i'm sure it sounds awesome it's a lot nicer than it was 
Um, Philip Morgan wants to know, does John make steel guitar pickups? You know, I consider doing that. I don't, but no, I actually did consider doing that. I think it's kind of a cool market. The, um, it was a very niche market, but, um, I always, I almost bought one. I don't, I don't know how to play one, but I, I, I like steel guitar. I just thought it would be cool to learn it, but and no, I don't, don't offer them. Okay. Cool. Um, let's see. Um, we're just going through questions. I know there was a question about uh, Saldano. I don't. I, I just. I saw there was a video that Mike put out the other day. Uh, yeah, I had dinner with Mike on Monday night. Oh, you did? Yeah. Cool. How's he doing? He's doing great. Is he psyched? Yeah, yeah. He loved everything. Um, so. Someone said boutique amps owners should be on Tone Talk. Avi. Uh, that might be a good idea, actually. <laughs> yeah, let's should have him on. Yeah. Um, I'll talk to him. Okay, yeah, let's have him on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm curious about that. I'm always curious about it because I've seen the videos of the – of of uh, their shop and you over yeah, there. the factory yeah. yeah yeah and I'm always curious as to how, like how how did he get into that it was it an offshoot of other um, electronics assembly work originally originally um, his um, father owned the company and uh, I mean this goes back a long way uh, I think the first thing that they did in their career was. Remember the old stereo boxes that went in the back of your car? You know, the yeah. subwoofers and things? Yeah. That, that they get. So they used to make those. So they made the uh, enclosures for those two. Enclosures yeah. and things. Yeah. And, and then uh, it was kind of a big PA company for a long time. And then that slowly transitioned into guitar amps. Uh, he would have to explain it all, but I mean, yeah, you know. I mean, he his father was doing it when he was just a little kid, when he was sweeping the floor in the shop. Hmm. So, um, you know, it's not a pretty job, though. To be honest, I mean, you're you're, you're a manufacturing company. That's not a great place yeah. to be, to be honest. Uh, I mean, like, you know, you're constantly worrying about, you know, how much gear, how much money's going out the door, so you could not yeah. lose money. You know, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, it's not, I, yeah, I, I, I had I don't I didn't realize it until I stopped doing photography, but I got that that sort of initial investment in parts, where to get them reliably, yeah. tooling. I got that done before I ever had to commit to that being my only business, which was actually a godsend, and I didn't realize it at the time. Gotcha. Uh, super chat from the Harmonicaster. Dave is boutique showing at no. Summer Nam, and the answer is no. Yeah, well, I mean, Brian Wampler will be there, and so will Matthew's effects, but um, no, no one else. Mm. Uh, thoughts on Zex coil pickups? I've not heard of them. You know, I oh, know I've heard of those. Yeah, I, I've, <laughs> never, I've never. Heard of them. Sorry, I'm familiar with what the. I, I think I'm familiar with what they look like and the concept behind them, but I've, I've never tried them. Uh, Furious George, for fuzz, what kind of germanium transistors sound best in the tone bender? The, I prefer 2N404 and 2N404A or other transist, germanium transistors marked differently, but are essentially those specs. I I bought, I bought a bunch of RCA. I think they're privately branded RCA uh, germanium transistors that uh, that I prefer for for a a tone bender type pedal. Mm -hmm. What is it? The um, there's there's basically the originals used a mullard that you cannot reliably get good ones of, of anymore, and frankly, I think they're they always were a little noisier than what you can get in a good 2N404. I actually prefer the sound of those. But the supply 
it's been a while since I've shopped for germanium transistors because I had a, a fairly good discovery of a, a supply of them. But I'll have to reevaluate whether or not I even want to make them when my supply runs out. Because hmm. I, don't, I don't know what the state of getting them is now for germanium. I don't know. I don't know that anyone. I could be wrong about this, but the last time I checked, there wasn't a good sounding. There wasn't anything that sounded like the old ones, really. Yeah. Talk to uh, Analog Man. Yeah, I don't know what he does. I mean, I'd assume he's got a he's got a, uh, a good stash of. He probably does. Yeah. 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 Um. Someone said, when did Mike Soldano put on a video on Instagram? No, actually, it was on um, Facebook. It may be on Instagram, but it was uh, uh, it was a short little video of just him playing a uh, non chassis uh, or a non. Yeah, it was a prototype Soldano, I guess. Or, so um, I so I have a, a in the last few minutes because I we're going to call it a, a day in the next like seven or so minutes. It's getting late. Um, no, before three hours. Yeah. Like, well, no, we at three hours. Well, we'll do it at three hours. We'll do I it. Just at yeah, there was seven oh, after or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're almost. We're actually. We got fifteen minutes if we want to go to the full three three hours. I, I, I'll be okay. Don't worry. <laughs> um, so I have a I have a, a confession I need to tell Dave. I figured I'd just do it right on on the show. Um, so I got a Kemper. That's it. It's over. <laughs> so um, I was like, am I going to tell Dave I got a Kemper? Um, <laughs> so, the show's done. The show's over. <laughs> That's it. This is our last episode with John. <laughs> um, no, actually, you know, I, I want to just give my review of it because I, I, uh, I think it's a very cool product. Re- very, very, very cool product. A lot of fun. Uh, but it still does not replace a tube amp. You know, I just wanted to say that, you know, and it does not feel right. It just does not feel it. There is, there's, it's very, very close, but there's still the feel is missing of what a real tube amp in a room with you sounds like. Turn up a real tube amp and play it versus turn up a Kemper loud and play it. There's a totally different feel Mm -hmm. going back to that feel of what one of the people asked earlier there's that feel yeah it sounds great there's some great sounds that you can get at lower volumes and recording wise but live i would still always use a tube amp so i love it i think it's a very cool product um and i'm glad that i got it but uh it's still i'm gonna have to get emperor trader what's that now i'm gonna trader (laughs) i'm a trader I, i you know i I, I, but I but I, I also feel like I need to talk. I, I kind of need to know about it to be able to talk about it. Yeah, you know? I understand. You know, so it's like I, we have the show. I even, you know, I, of course, this is the excuse I give my, to my wife. But, um, you know, I, I need I need the gear to understand what I'm talking about. But no, it was really uh, it was an enlightening experience. It's cool. The floorboard that comes with it is very cool. Uh, there's a lot of good things about it, but it's still not going to sound like a real tube amp. So I'm not just saying that to blow smoke up Dave's ass. That is the truth. If I go play with a band, I would play with a tube amp. No doubt about it. Um, but it's fun. It's a cool thing to have. Uh, oh, we got Andy Pesia for a super chat. Thanks, man. Thank you, man. No, no question either. So thank you. So Deja Blue says, are you returning it, Mark? I, uh, so I actually had kept the box. For just the po- in case. Just in case the possibility that it was going to go back. Um, so you you talking about Kempers is like the the is the amp equivalent of people talking about uh, Demarzio double cream trademark. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's here's my problem with it, and I'll say it on this show. My problem is, is especially since I'm I'm, I'm uh, partners with Dave. Is that it comes loaded with a fried man profile? Jeez, oh, of course it does. And that's bullshit, in my opinion. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah. That is bullshit. It should not come loaded with an amp that says your name on it. 
regardless uh-huh. of and and that to me is bullshit and I uh, you know I almost took a picture of it and sent it to you but I'm sure well how does how does it say it it says fried and then space and then man hmm. that might be that might be actually questionable as far as uh um our trademark it's yeah i'll send you a picture of it i didn't send it to that could be argued that could be argued i think it could be (laughs) i think it could be argued personally um and it what's what sucks about it is it comes on the amp preloaded so that's it's not like you're going into the the rig manager and you're downloading somebody's profile that says fried man or whatever. It's on there when you buy the Kemper. And that's not yeah. cool. It's yeah. not it's not cool. If yes, they you know, if they have like, you know, Marshall's, you know, old sixty nine Marshall or, you know, whatever, fender amps and all that stuff, that's cool. But you're gonna put on a B E one hundred and you know, it's a fried man, that's bullshit. So that's my opinion. Um then someone wrote, I knew about this, Mark. I saw you in the forums. <laughs> I know. So, so I, I, I almost had to uh, give it up because someone wrote, Mark with a Kemper? Oh, my God. Dave's going to flip out. <laughs> so, uh, that's too funny. So um, someone gave me a thumbs down. There you go. All right. Thumbs down for the Kemper talk. Sorry. I, I don't have a Kemper because it doesn't even look amp-like enough. No. As as- oh, God, no. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't hey, look cool. Is what is that? Hey, it, I, seriously, I don't know why, but it, if it were in some combo form that looked like amp, I might be changing my opinion on it. But yeah, it's it definitely weird. has a weird like you know. My son said it looked like you know like uh, airplane controls. Yeah, 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 um, an airplane dashboard. So, uh, but anyway. You know, I'll send you that picture, Dave, so you have it. Okay. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so in the last few minutes that we've got, um, I wanted to talk about some of our uh, guests that are coming up. But before I do that, actually, um, do you want to tell us, John, where people can reach you and buy your pickups oh. and your pedals? And uh, com. All over the internet. Yep, and don't um, don't do it how I spelled it with a W. I will. Oh, edit. did you actually? Spell yeah, I'll uh, I'll edit that out before uh, once we get done actually, with the video. Actually, the, I chose that name because uh, I couldn't get the URL. It was as practical goal as that. I started dropping letters until I could get it. So I dropped the I dropped the W. This was years ago, and it, someone had that, and then I dropped the C, and then I could get the URL. <laughs> so that, but that was the name of the business, and. Um, they can order directly from us or through uh, dealers, places like Chicago Music Exchange has their pickups. Uh, Collings offers them as a uh, option in their guitars. Places like uh, Johan Gustafsson, Novo Guitars. Oh, I'm probably forgetting somebody. But, you know, high quality custom guitar makers regularly order from us and they offer them as an option. Um, and a lot of dealers stock the Collings guitars with our pickups um they can order from us directly our dealers and uh am i forgetting something oh we i do have a youtube channel called Throw, throwback guitar lounge subscribe oh yeah yeah and uh, i i kind of started it just so we could put videos on to answer some of the questions that i get frequently through email and over the phone but we're trying to do something every week, and people like them. So uh, there's been a couple of weeks here in the summer where we haven't done anything. But I did a video that shows how I like to adjust the height of humbuckers or PAF style pickups. Hmm. And it's 28 minutes long. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's great. Uh, but people <laughs> really watch that thing, and because oh, uh, people watch our four-hour shows too. I understand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> More than I, once. I, I, I did that video just because, I, I, the, you know, sort of the gen, for, a, for a humbucker, the general way people adjust it is they use a measurement. And it doesn't really work for individual setup. You know, it doesn't work for it, 
it, one measurement doesn't work for everything because people. No, say, not at all. String gauge. Yeah, uh, everything. String gauge, all that. So I just go step by step through how I do it, and people people watch it. So anyway, yeah, that's subscribe cool. to the Throwback Guitar Watch YouTube channel. It's in this palatial room here that we do the videos. Awesome, so, cool. Great. This palatial room that's only ten by ten feet. And make sure you guys well, yeah. order order pickups and pedals. I'm I'm really interested in the um, uh, the stone bender. Yeah, that that's always been a really good seller for us. Yeah, especially that, after um, that. Then the overdrive boosts are too big a selling. Strangely, recently the the strange master has been. I've wondered uh, if it's the uh, the uh, Ron Thor no Pete Thor Pete Thorn video. Mm -hmm. He did one recently, and then there was an article in a guitarist magazine, I think, about treble boosters yes and yeah it, it it mentioned ours but overdrive boost sells really well for us also that i over the years there's a lot of session guys that use that just because it's yeah. so adjustable tonally yeah you know awesome well you guys make sure you check them out um john i want to thank you for coming on man oh thank you thank no, you I, I really do enjoy this show because it's got a level of guitar nerdery that appeals to me <laughs> well, that's that's why we do it. That's why we do it, and I, I love it. Uh, we've got some guests coming up that are uh, awesome, um, and uh, I'm gonna go through them right now, real quickly. Uh, we've got Nilly Brosh, um, who is an awesome guitar player. Uh, she's gonna be coming on, uh, I believe, July. What are we in? July? I think it's July 27th or something. I'll let you know, Dave. Um, mm -hmm. And then I'm in the process of setting up uh, with Reverb, uh, Frank Fleckenstein, who works for Reverb, uh, to have him come on. Um, and oh. then um, we are pretty much going to confirm that Steve Vai is going to come on the show. So I'm not booked exactly yet, but absolutely he said yes. So we're psyched about Steve Vai. That'll be awesome. Um, uh, we're working in August. Yeah, in August point. time from we'll, we'll work yeah. on that. Um, and then uh, I know we're gonna we're gonna have Mike Soldano back on to talk about what he's working on. Yeah. Uh, so that I'll be reaching out to him. Uh, There's potential possible. We we also need to uh, go for Delana. Yes. Uh, we need I, to make that happen. I need to call her. Uh, and. Uh, there will probably be a, a, a version two of the Jakey Lee that's going to come uh, at some point. I'm not sure when yet. That might be a last minute thing because mm -hmm. uh, as to how this happens, it might be a last minute show. <clears throat> but um, let's see. Yep. Yep. That'll be awesome. Um, and then also I wanted to. Uh, when I can get it scheduled, we want to have Pete Thorne and Holly Henderson to come on and talk about yep. her, her album that Pete produced. Um, I know. Oh, people have been asking about Lou Cather, Steve Lou Cather. Yeah. The, okay. Steve said he would come on. And he would be happy to come on. Uh, the problem is Steve tours constantly. He's all over the place. So it's hard. It's hard to nail him down to when he's going to be home. I'll work on that. I'll actively work on that. Yeah, that would be awesome to have him on. Um, so that's it. Uh, we're uh, we'll be back in a couple weeks. Hope everybody has Billy a great week. Dustin would be a good one. Yes. Oh, and who was the other guy that you mentioned? Uh, Gilby Clark. Gilby Clark. Also, I would I would like to have um, a Billy Duffy. Someone just said that, and and I can make that happen. It's funny I forget about people sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it, you know you forget. It's like, oh yeah, I know him. I do work for him. Oh yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely uh, have John Sir back on. Uh, he just did. He did a bunch of shows with us, so I think he. That was, was like, a very interesting show. I, I did enjoy that one quite a bit. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah it was awesome. Um, he's he's great. Um, so you're a total geek. You watched a bunch of these. <laughs> Yeah, no, the, yeah, I'm really, I, I just find it very interesting. Even, even the, the most obscure details I find interesting. <laughs> well, yeah, and you find out things like, and, and sometimes in shock, yeah. <laughs> while you're, 
while you're while you're hearing these stories, you know, especially with artists, sometimes you get in shock. Yeah. You're like, he said what? Right. Who? Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, is that way with the Jakey Lee one? Yeah. He said what? <laughs> Speaking of J- Jakey Lee with Sharon Osbourne, you see Sharon Osbourne just said some shit about uh, um, Daisley? No. She called him an old fuck who should get over being fired from Ozzy. Oh, God. I was like... <sighs> Some more stuff to talk about with Jakey Lee. Yeah, exactly. Part two. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, well, everybody have I'll a great... T- I'll tell you about some other stuff that I got a recent text from him about. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. Um, someone says Dan Huff, Steve Stevens. Steve Stevens will come back eventually, I'm sure. Yeah, he said he would come back for to talk about his new band and stuff, so... Yep. Try yeah. to get try to get Evan Rubinson of Dean. Yeah, I don't know if he'll be coming. Up. Oh, that'd be interesting. Yeah, that would be interesting. That would be very interesting. Yeah, right now right. Be... I don't know if he could talk about much though. Yeah. Maybe with the lawsuit. Yeah, he probably wouldn't be able to yeah. talk. But yeah, right. that is interesting. I actually saw an interesting before we go. I saw an interesting thing. Uh, one of the guys from Reverend Guitars, I think it was Reverend Guitar. No, 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 not Reverend. Um, Nailer, Joe Nailer. Yeah, from Reverend pulled, Guitar. Oh, is it Reverend Guitars? Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Then, yeah. That they pulled pulled down all their any of their guitars that were resembled Gibson guitars. Uh, hmm. I was like, he's like, they interesting. Mean, they mean business. I was like, huh, wow. Yes, Chris Shiflett also with Foo Fighters. Oh, dude, I would love to have Chris Shiflett on. That's totally. all possible. Yep. Oh, it's Dean. How about it's... Dave Grohl? <sighs> I wonder if I can get Dave Grohl. Well, you got to make the call, man. <laughs> Might be able to. Oh, uh, Dave's so cool, too. Dave is Dave's so super cool. Now, Mark Ignacy, I've, I reached out to him. He never wrote me back, so whatever. <laughs> this is the time for him to write you back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wrote him a long time ago when he was at Norm's right. in right? yeah. So, uh, yeah. oh, and Paul Reed Smith, I've actually reached out to I Dave, I finally I figured out that email address by the way. Oh yeah, yeah, you told me. Yeah, so um Yeah, so I Paul Reed Smith said he would come on, but I haven't heard back, so. So we'll see. But anyway, well, we hit the 3 hour mark, so Oh, good. John, you reached it, buddy. Uh, I got the full <laughs> you made it. <laughs> thank, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, you're thank welcome. you, man. I enjoy. It. I have I have cemented my spot in the annals of guitar YouTube geekdom. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you, man. It's awesome. So, um, yeah, the Hall of Tone. <laughs> So, oh my God! Deja Blue wrote, writes, Bogner and Jakey Lee, same show, lots of alcohol. Oh yeah, God, that would, I don't think I'd, I don't think I'd survive that one. Yeah, that would no, <laughs> <laughs> not gonna happen. That would be crazy. Uh, oh God! I, yeah. All right, everybody, have a great night. Enjoy the weekend. Right. John, stick around for just a minute while I end the show. All right, take yeah. care, everybody. Enjoy. See you guys.